I want to be forever young. Do you really want to live forever? Forever. And ever. One song. Today is November 16th, 2019. I'm Brent Nally, and I'm here with an incredible person, Dr. Michael Fossil. Dr. Michael Fossil is probably the only person who has been bitten by, wrestled with, and kissed a gorilla. And, and I bit the gorilla, too. <laughs> and he bit the gorilla. Back. We'll get into more uh, details about that if we have time because that's a really fun story. Michael has toured and stayed in multiple Buddhist monasteries on three continents. Michael tied, gagged, and drugged a CIA agent who threatened to kill him. We gotta talk about that one. Michael is the founding editor of Rejuvenation Research. Michael has lectured in Danish, French, Arabic, in Japanese, but he can also at least dabble in a few more languages than that. We'll get into that. And Michael proposed to his wife after knowing her for seven days after meeting her in a hypnosis lab. I found out about a little bit more details from listening to another interview of yours on that, so I think we should touch upon that as well, too. But Michael Fossil does not spell his last name the same way as a paleontologist might. So it's not a perfect mix there. He doesn't work on dino dinosaur bones. Michael Fossil has a very interesting background separate from the things that we mentioned. Uh, and I want to mention Michael has agreed to do a interview with me at the end of January at Longevity Therapeutics Conference in San Francisco. I'm located just outside the San Francisco Bay Area, so stay subscribed for that. We'd love to have a lot more fun and build, hopefully, on what we'll discuss today. So a little bit more of a typical introduction. Um, Michael uh, has written three books, Reversing Human Aging in 1996. I'll have Michael share a little bit more details about this, but this is really the first book where people can see how we can re legitimately reverse human aging, or at the very least aspects of human aging. And that's what this conversation is gonna be about. So I want people to understand that Michael is very credentialed here and he's been discussing these details for many, many years and is very well respected in this uh, area. 2004, Michael wrote his second book, Cells, Aging and Human Disease, which I will read the preface to that in a little bit, because I think that's phenomenal. Um, I don't know if you remember <laughs> all the details in that, so it might be kind of like going in a journey to the past for you as well, Michael, for that one. And then 2015, the telomerase revolution, the enzyme that holds the key to human aging and will soon lead to longer, healthier lives. And again, that was 2015. Finally, Michael has been on ABC, NBC, Fox, CNN, BBC, Discovery Channel, NPR, and now the pinnacle of all media right now is YouTube channel. Absolutely. So, Michael, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I'm really excited uh, for all the things that we're going to discuss. Welcome. Thanks, Brad. Glad you let me on. <laughs> Definitely. Um, you didn't have to get through many gate gatekeepers or anything like that, like the, like the big uh, the big media giants there. So final little intro before we uh, jump into uh, the, the interview. Right now, Michael is the president of Telesite, which was also founded in 2015, the same year he wrote his most recent book. And before that, Michael was a professor at Michigan State from 1984 to 2012, teaching medical students. Uh, he has other credentials and jobs on here, but we'll just hit the education before we jump into it. So Wesleyan University, Michael has a BA and MA from, excuse me, in psychology, and then a PhD in neurobiology from Stanford, and then also an MD from Stanford. All right. So that's all the credentials. That's the interesting stuff. Uh, let's jump into it, Michael. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And I want to give you an opportunity to start off sharing anything that's top of mind that you might think that the 
listeners, if people are listening or watchers want to hear and start off? You know, let me say something about aging. Uh, most people think it's really simple. It, quote, just happens, unquote. And in consequence, they've been unable to do anything about it. Aging is actually much more complicated than that. And as a result, it turns out to be really easy to change. Um, I first ran into this when I was teaching neuroanatomy at Stanford Medical School. And when I talk about age-related diseases, people would shrug and say, again, it just happens, you rust, you get old. And I found that a remarkably blasé attitude. Uh, and I suspected there was more to it than that. And really, when you look into it, you find it's it's actually, as I say, very complicated, very complex, very sophisticated. But as a result, once you understand it, it's pretty easy to change. Okay. So would you say that in late 2019 here, it's November 16th, 2019, would you say that most people within the aging field, and I know that's that's even a kind of a hard we can get into details more about that because there isn't really like an aging field. You have gerontology, right? You can get a degree and there's, there's other things, but um, would you say that most of your people who at least consider themselves to be aging focused would agree with that or not? Uh, I think not. Um, but let me give you an analogy. I mean, I see the same thing in Alzheimer's research that I see with regard to aging. Um, in, in Alzheimer's research, there's an incredible amount of effort and money, for that matter, going into it. Um, and there are people take it very seriously. Uh, but no one's ever been able to really alter Alzheimer's. Uh, they can deal with some of the symptoms. They can show some interesting changes that sort of delay it for a matter of weeks, for example. I'm seriously I'm talking weeks. Um, uh, but when you talk to most of the people, most of the people involved, they don't have an overall model of Alzheimer's. They don't have an understanding of Alzheimer's. They have targets. They have techniques. And frankly, they have failures. But the same thing is really true in aging in general. Uh, people don't have an overall understanding of aging. And in the same sense that most people in Alzheimer's have a fairly um, pessimistic attitude, that is, they think maybe we can slow it, but we can't stop it or reverse it. That's really been true of aging, too. Uh, when I look at, at longevity companies and, and anti-aging companies now, uh, what I find is that most of them are actually concentrating on trying to slow something down and that they have... Uh, they don't really understand the whole concept of aging, how it really works, because it isn't just entropy. And they don't um, have any optimistic idea of actually reversing aging also. There was a talk I gave at NIH 24 years ago, 23 years ago this year, 24 years ago next January, but um, where I got up, and the title of the talk was Reversing Human Aging. And I got up in front of these several hundred researchers and physicians. Um, and I said, listen, before I even start this hour lecture, let me say that anyone who leaves this room in an hour and thinks you can reverse aging is a fool. Anyone who leaves this room in an hour and thinks you cannot reverse aging is a fool. If you are sensible, you'll leave this room in an hour saying, I don't know if we can or not show me the data. Now, since that time, there's been considerably more data. And I think that the, the argument that I began to make then and certainly would make now is that, yes, we can reverse aging. We just have to understand how it works. We can't do it with small molecules. It's not a matter of resveratrol or NADA, NAD+. It's a matter of understanding the basic concepts. But again, in parallel, it's the same problem we have in Alzheimer's research. People are just randomly hitting targets they think will work and they don't pan out. Got it. Um, so why do you think in 2019 there are still so many otherwise, in my opinion, very intelligent people in the aging field who just generally either disagree with what you just said there or just haven't understood what you just said there yet. In other words, they're, they're still focusing on, you know, the molecule, the NAD plus, the resveratrol. Why are they still taking this route? And why has it, why is it that when I read the 1996 book of yours, it's so incredible the information there. But most of it is still very true today. I saw you said, I think the body's made up of about 100 billion cells. Now I think we know it's somewhere around 30 to 40 trillion. There's little things like that. But for the most part, I went through and read that book again. It's all very accurate. So why is it that this isn't being understood by more intelligent people in this field in your best opinion? Well, it's partly an inertial problem. Um, you know, what you grow up believing, you tend to continue to believe. And people don't actually often examine the assumptions. Um, also, frankly, uh, most of us, and probably myself included, uh, at, at some level believe in, in magical thinking. 
um, we don't actually look more carefully at what's going on. Historically, this has always been true too. You know, if I look at um, the Copernican revolution compared to the Ptolemaic universe, you can explain the entire universe in terms of the Ptolemaic universe, but it gets very ad hoc and difficult. You have to start assuming that, that the speed of light varies in different places. I mean, it gets very complicated. The major problem with the Ptolemaic theory, for example, is it was not elegant. It's not that you couldn't use it, but it's a mess on any level, mechanics, let alone more modern. Level. But the same thing is true uh, if you look at microbial theory. You know, if I go back, uh, say, 1500s, 17, early 1700s, uh, people really tended to believe that diseases were caused by magical causes. You know, it was a curse. It was the act of God. It was things just happened, much like many people think about aging. Um, getting people to believe in microbial theory was an uphill battle. It's complicated. It's a very complicated theory. It has a lot of ramifications. But once you get it, you can do things like cure disease. You can use antibiotics. You can use immunizations. You can do things like cure polio, which you cannot do with diet and wishful thinking. Um, the same thing is true if I look at heavier than air flight. Uh, people, uh, you know, Lord Kelvin said it will never be able to have a heavier than air flight because obviously it's impossible, um, bumblebees aside. Um, and people were busy trying to perfect hot air balloons, which were okay, but I'm sorry, Kitty Hawk did a better job. And I think that's where we are too. I, I'll give you an example of this too. If I'm, and I, I can think of a couple of people I know who have been involved in this. Uh, one of them is a, the lead chief scientific officer at a, a major global pharmaceutical firm that I talked to about a year or two ago. And um, she has spent 40 years of her professional career working on beta amyloid. And if, if she would understand the model more deeply, she'd realize that beta amyloid plays a role, but it's not the cause of Alzheimer's disease. But for her to accept that undermines 40 years of her professional career. None of us want to hear that. I wouldn't want to hear it either. And what if everything that you, you believed in and worked hard for 40 years was in fact a red herring in a sense. Um, and again, I, I don't mean to belittle beta, beta amyloid, but to think that beta amyloid causes Alzheimer's is sort of like saying that um, a bleeding is the, the only cause of death in Ebola infections. No, it's the underlying virus that's the cause of it, and bleeding plays a role in some patients. Uh, but the same is true of beta amyloid. It's not the cause, but it, it's an important part of the process in most patients. So, it's difficult for people to get over that hurdle. It's difficult for people to look back. I sometimes say that the key to moving ahead is to step backward and examine your assumptions. And most of us don't like to do that. It's human nature. Definitely. And that's a saying that Dr. Ed Park, who I know is a, a big fan of yours as well and who has interviewed you, uh, has that saying as well. I think he says something like, in order to go forward, sometimes we have to go backward first. So. Um, At the very least, you need to ask yourself, where are you standing? What are your assumptions? What are your foundations? And have you looked carefully at them? Again, the, you know, to go back, to say we're 1500s and smallpox is coming through our local village in someplace in Europe. Um, if our assumption is that it's an act of God, that already limits our responses. And it does not include things like vaccination from the young, young milkmaid who has cowpox. It doesn't include that concept. Um, we really do have to step back and say, am I right even in my most basic assumptions? Because that's where you get advances. If I look back medically over the past 200 years and ask myself, what have really been the major innovations in medicine? It has not been cardiac transplants, the latest statin, stents, um, in, in robotic surgery. Those are incremental advances, and they also tend to be expensive advances. The, single mo the, the most impressive advances, most innovative advances in medicine at all, historically, have actually been conceptual advances. Things like washing your hands before you deliver a baby, things like aseptic surgery, things like microbial theory. And these have had a greater impact on the quality of human life than anything else we have ever done in medicine, bar nothing. Also, those same advances have actually lowered the cost of medical care, not raised it. You know, if it's 1952, uh, a lot of people are concentrating on improving the iron lung and pulmonary care. But Salk was concentrating on a vaccine. And right now, if we did not have Salk vaccines or anything else, we would now have the world's most expensive and impressive iron lungs in some sense. I mean, we'd be intubating and doing it other ways, but still, it would be very impressive and very expensive. Instead of that, we have Salk vaccines. We have almost wiped out polio in this world away. And the current cost per patient of vaccination globally is between 10 and 12 cents per patient. 
that's a lot cheaper than an iron lung and it results in a lot better patient lives. But that's the point here. If we're looking at things like age-related diseases, the important, the important uh, avenues for the future are not to perfect heart transplants. And it's not to perfect a lot of other things. It's to understand the underlying concepts. And if we do that right, we can actually lower the global cost of healthcare. It's a major issue right now because most countries, you know, I, I've been asked to testify uh, in the UK at the House of Lords um, because they're concerned about the growing cost of healthcare and the projections are enormous. Same in the US. Um, but I think that rather than bankrupting um, national governments or healthcare systems in general globally within the next 50 years, we're actually going to be able to lower those costs to less than 10% of current costs because we'll have conceptual advances, not incremental advances, but true innovation. That's very well stated. And this was one of my questions. So I think it's a brilliant time to just bring it up. Let's talk about the economics of curing human aging, or at least dramatically extending humans' health span and lifespan, and what that will mean um, for our society in general, in general, globally. So before we jump into that, I want folks to understand Telesite, and I want to give you an opportunity to share more details, but what Telesite is trying to do is cure Alzheimer's. Um, and then eventually, if Alzheimer's is cured, then maybe Telesite can pivot and have a different mission statement of curing aging altogether. Um, but what a lot of people don't really understand right now is the problems. Um, people are living much, much longer, but in their advanced ages, they're not living. And I apologize if you guys can hear that noise here. Um, but people are not living in these advanced ages as healthily as you know, they were in their 60s, 70s. I'll give an example. My wife, her grandmother is 95. Life is not too great for her right now, but she's alive. And it is having a lot of costs on our family, emotionally, financially for her. She's worried if she's going to run out of money at some point. Um, so I won't go into a whole lot of details, but the major point here is this is not how human history was for so many years. This is a relatively new phenomenon within the last few generations. So it's important that we solve this type of problem. And what Telesite um, is doing is, I think, the best route. It's the best ROI to do that, in my opinion. So I'll let Michael kind of share some more details now that I've grown out. Yeah, no, that, and that brings up another interesting point. You know, back um, about eight years ago, the Pew Foundation did a, a, a survey. And what they said to people was, if you could live an additional, say, 20 years, would you want to do it? And many people said no. Um, but many people, if you ask them about an additional 20 years, envision an additional 20 years in the nursing home. And as you've already alluded or implied, most of us have no interest in an additional 20 years in the nursing home. On the other hand, if you ask people, what if you could have an additional 20 years playing tennis, wrestling with your grandchildren, uh, gardening, traveling, uh, dancing, whatever, uh, that's a different matter. And most of us see that as an entirely different, different way of, of, of living. Uh, and I think that's what we're looking at. You, you really cannot, you know, we've reached the limits of extending the human lifespan without, ex without changing the aging process. And that's occurred demographically, really, over the past 200 years. Um, we have sort of rectangularized the curve. You know, it, if we go back 200 years, most of 200 years ago, most of us died of infectious disease at relatively young age or trauma. Um, and now we tend to live a lot longer, but we're encroaching on that that, that age-related disease part of life. And the only way to affect that is to understand the basic aging process. Now, Leonard ha Leonard Hayflick put it very very nicely. He said, you know, everybody argues that aging plays a role in age-related diseases but they're not willing to actually look at the cause of aging. And it's true, we cannot affect age-related diseases, we cannot increase the quality of human lifespan until we actually understand aging, the aging process itself and how it's expressed in disease. That's critical, it's the only way to move ahead. Very well stated. Uh, Leonard Hayflick was somebody who I wanted to bring up, so why don't you share a little bit more details about your friend, Len, and his contributions to aging science. Len, I sometimes say, is my favorite curmudgeon. Um, Leonard is somebody who really ought to have a Nobel Prize. He did some remarkable work uh, in a number of different areas within biology. But from my perspective, the important thing was what's currently called the Hayflick limit. 
And what he pointed out, if we went back to, say, 1950, there were a lot of people who felt that aging was something that occurred between cells, but not within cells. That is, cells were immortal, but somehow uh, the, the multicellular organism was not. And Len pointed out that, that, in fact, cells age themselves. If you look at them carefully in the Petri dish, in a sense, uh, you'll find that they divide a certain number of times and they grow increasingly more dysfunctional and they get to the point where they won't divide. That's simplifying it somewhat, but that's basically it. Um, and that was a revolution in biology. Uh, and there were a lot of people who began to suspect that that Hayflick limit had something to do with aging, and it does. Again, it turns out to be more complicated than just that, but that's why we age. Len is the one who first put his finger on that. Definitely. And when you say that's why we age, all organisms uh, age a little bit differently. And it appears that the Hayflick limit is affected in different ways by different animals. So in other words, rats are not going to age in the same way. In other words, they're not going to hit the Hayflick limit in the same way that humans do. Um, is something that's interesting and that we're learning more and more about every year. Well, actually, it's interesting because many people, you know, if you're talking about telomeres and aging, which we'll get into, I'm sure, many people have the misconception that telomere length uh, might might be the, uh, how do I put this, the telomere length determines your lifespan. And it, it turns out that even if we are, are just trying to be simplistic about it, that's wrong. What you do find is that the rate of telomere loss is, is linked to your lifespan in any number of species we've looked at. So the longer you live, the, the faster you lose telomeres. It's not absolute length. You might say it's not absolute length, it's relative length. It's what have you lost, not how long is your telomeres. That's why you find there, there are some uh, hybrid varieties of mice that have telomeres that are literally 10 times longer than mine, but their lifespan is about 40, 40 times shorter than mine. Um, it's not the telomere length. The really important issue is not just the rate of loss, but it's how it affects the change in gene expression that occurs as we age, because that's what causes cells to become dysfunctional and old. Um, so it's complicated. Uh, Len was right in that it has to do with cell division. Uh, the initial suggestions were that it was telomere length, which again, in a simplistic sense, is almost right. Uh, and we do know uh, from now, um, actually 21 years ago, we know that if you reset the telomeres, you can reset aging in human cells. So we've already shown that you can reverse aging in cells. That's not a question. The question is how effectively can we do it? How effectively can we do it in people? And you're referencing Geron Corporation there, correct? I am. One of the, I mean, one of the key papers that came out was early in the 90s. There were a number of them that were fascinating, but I won't get into it. But they, they showed this same relationship between telomere length and cell age. Now, again, it turns out to be more complicated. But uh, the correlation was pretty clear. That is, uh, if I know what species I'm looking at, I can tell you how many more cell divisions that cell has based on telomere length, what it started with, where it is now. Um, but in 1998, there was a page, paper put out by Bodner et al. And what she and her group showed, she and the group at Geron showed, was that if you reset telomere length, you reset the clock of aging cells. And in fact, you reset gene expression. And it was a year, two years after that, um, that they showed that actually you can do the same thing in human tissues. So you can actually take old human skin cells and you can grow young human skin. It's not that aging is immutable. It just is. It's just a matter of understanding how it, it, how it can be changed and what it is. And can that work be easily found with a Google search? Because I'd love to include that in the show notes um, if we have a to that. You can certainly find it in my textbook, the Oxford University Press textbook. Uh, it's in there. Look under Bodnar in the, in the bibliography. And there are, what, some 4,700 references, and it's all in there someplace. The Cells, Aging, and Human Disease book, correct? Yeah, that's the, it's actually not only the first, but still the only textbook on how aging actually works. It's a really great read, and I actually think it's an appropriate time now to read the preface to that because it ties into everything we're talking about. So um, this might be like uh, a stroll down memory lane for you. We'll see. So this is the preface again of cells, aging, uh, and disease. It, cells, aging, and human uh, disease from, excuse me. Uh, yes, that's correct. It's from 2004. Mm -hmm. The major danger of technology is not what we may play, not that we may play God, 
but that we may refuse to work at being fully human. Compassion is the highest of human motivations, allowing us first to understand, then to prevent the suffering, fear, and tragedy of others. Our enemy, our enemy is not death, which will forever be with us, but avoidable suffering, which need not be. The ubiquity of disease is no more ordained than it is the rarity of individual compassion, but it is in our power to lessen the former through our dedication to the latter. The aim is to understand how diseases of aging occur, that we may prevent human suffering. Helping those around us is not, quote, playing God, end quote, but is, if it has a sacred meaning, God's work. To denigrate this dedication, to avoid our responsibility, to ignore the suffering of those around us is neither human nor forgivable. We cannot assume that if someone suffers, the creator of the universe must have wanted it that way. Our ignorance of divine intent is no justification for a lack of mercy. Finally, the age of those who suffer does not mitigate nor alter our responsibility for them. Few are callous enough to ignore the suffering of children. Some would ignore the, and trivialize suffering in the elderly. Having been children, perhaps we remember our own helplessness and fear, yet remain unable to predict or understand the suffering of those who walk ahead of us in time. Compassion for the young is common. An equal compassion for the old should be no less equally common. Its lack indicts our besets, uh, basis egoism and, res and rests upon a willful ignorance of life. I had to read that like three times um, because it's so powerful and it's the words were so carefully chosen and it's still super relevant for today right now, 15 years approximately later, and that people just don't fully understand um, what your mission is, you know, what, what I'm trying to focus my time and energy and effort on and why. So I think that that was just so eloquently stated and I want to give you an opportunity to kind of share what, what that means to you. Yeah, it, it worries me when people trivialize age-related disease. Um, somebody once said that, you know, none of us ever, none of, none of us actually um, become adults. We just get better at faking it. Um, it's also been said, and I think truthfully, that you know, inside every one of us is still a 10-year-old and a 5-year-old and a 20-year-old, no matter what your age. Uh, you don't think of yourself as old, and yet you know, your body is. Um, but I don't see that there's a, a, any lesser value in somebody who's 65 or 85 than somebody who's 25. And any, any loss of life can be a tragedy, but for me, it's usually the pain and the suffering that worries me. As I say, we will all die. I will die. You will die. Um, but we need not die fearfully or in pain if we can avoid these things, nor do we have to live that way. And I think we can do something about it. This brings up another point that sometimes um, people slip into. Uh, there's a concern sometimes that if we extend the healthy human lifespan, what does that do to the population of the planet? Reasonable question. Um, but let me give you two alternatives. Let me give you one alternative where we say, all right, at say age 65, we will uh, stop treating anybody and we'll make sure that they die. We'll lower the population. Um, and we have another world where uh, it's a little more crowded, uh, but we have uh, an overall compassion for anybody regardless of age. The question is, can we make your life a higher quality? Um, the problem with that first world is not that it's got a high population. The problem is that it lacks any compassion whatsoever. Um, if we can let people die at 85, we can let them die at 65, we can let them die at 45, we can let them die at 15. Um, I, don't, I don't want to live in a world like that. Most of us wouldn't. Uh, so, yeah, it, you know, there are concerns when we do things, and we can come back to some of these. But I think we have to keep a firm grasp on an important concept, which is compassion, caring for people because they are people. Very, very well stated. And I'd love it, Michael, if you can tell the story I've heard you say in a few podcasts about um, the elderly woman who said she didn't want to take a pill if she could to live longer. But at the same time, you started talking to her, well, why are you here in the doctor's office today? That's a great that one. Was, that was Mrs. Johnson. And this is back 
now 24 years ago when the book first came out when I was lecturing at NIH. Um, and a reporter came in and he wanted to talk to an elderly patient. And I, I asked her if she'd be willing to talk to him. And he, she was. She was, yes, about 94. And she was there for pneumonia. So he came in and the very first thing he said to her was, Mrs. Johnson, if Dr. Fossil had a pill that would reverse aging, would you take it? And by the way, of course, her name isn't Mrs. Johnson, but it'll do. Um, and she said, in a sort of an old squeaky voice, she said, no, I'd let nature take its course. And I said, Mrs. Johnson, I have a question. I noticed that your knuckles are all swollen. Looks like arthritis. She said, oh, it's terrible. The Motrin's not helping anymore. And I said, and I noticed here you've got a big scar on your chest. What's that? She said, quadruple bypass. I said, and why are you here today, Mrs. Johnson? She said, you know why I'm here. I've got pneumonia. I think I need to be, oh, I see what you're driving at. I take the pill. Because you know, aging sounds fine until it's your arthritis and your coronary arteries going to hell and your immune system malfunctioning. That's different. Most people would just as soon be treated, thank you, and be able to get rid of the pain and the fear and the suffering. And they're right. It's a great story. It hammers home the point so well. And I like to separate aging into two categories. Most people have the categories combined, but they don't understand where the science of biological aging and, and testing for that. We'll get into DNA methylation, telomere length in a bit, but there's biological aging and then there's chronological aging. You mentioned this, I believe, in your book, um, the telomerase revolution, the, the most recent one. Chronological aging is simple. It's the day you were born. My wife is almost 42 weeks pregnant. That day is set in stone. It's not going to change. Then there's biological aging, and there's new innovative ways that we can measure that, and it will continue to improve that science as well. And so you're referring to the both, essentially, but we want people to understand the differences there, and that biological aging, there's nothing really like good about that. Wisdom, experience, all those things are in the more chronological. Those are those are all great and things that we should value and continue to value. I agree. So, speaking of that, and speaking of telomeres, um, I want to put together a little sentence here that's trying to hammer home the language because this is difficult stuff, and I want to get your thoughts on this. So. In my opinion, the data shows that telomere shortening probably has the greatest negative impact on human aging and age-related diseases, at least more than any other one thing that we can see or point out. So I'm not saying that telomeres cause human aging. Therefore, activating telomerase as much as possible in, in as many human cells as possible is probably our current best intervention to slow, stop, and maybe even reverse aspects of human aging, or maybe all of human aging and age-related diseases. That was a mouthful, but I'm trying to get this. Let me step back for a second. You know, I used to get residents that come in and I'd be training them, and I'd ask them what was their job, and they said their job was to diagnose the patient. And I'd say, no, it's not. Okay, your job is to make the patient's life better. Now, that often, not always. That often involves finding the diagnosis. Pretty standard part of it. But that's not your job. Your job is to make the patient's life better if that's at all possible. That's a different thing. No patient wants to just come in, be told something in Latin, and go home. They want to know if you can make their life better. Correct. And you can't always do it. But the same thing is really true with regard to age related disease and aging. I sometimes say I have no interest in what causes aging, except as it helps me understand where I can intervene. The question I have is not what causes aging, which turns out to be a necessary part of the second part of this sentence. My interest is where is the single most effective point of clinical intervention and financial intervention that lets me cure and prevent age-related disease? Where is the most effective place to make somebody's life better? And the answer to that is almost certainly the telomere. It's not the only place. Uh, let me give you an analogy. Um, you know, if there are always alternatives. If you come in with coronary artery disease, uh, we can do a coronary artery bypass graft, replace some of the coronary arteries. We can do stents. Uh, we can simply put you on a number of drugs, for example, statins. We can do a heart transplant. None of that affects the underlying process of age-related disease. It may be useful, but it also tends to be expensive and uncomfortable and costs, you know, it's, it's, there are problems, side effects. 
Um, so my question still is, is there a more effective way that's safe, cheaper, works better? And there is. There are lots of ways to do this. Um, but even when we're looking at, even when we understand aging, um, I'm thinking about, let me give you an example here of Alzheimer's again. There are a number of things that increase the rate of cell aging in the human brain. Um, among them, um, the chronologic age, obviously, you know, you get older, you increase your risk. There are a certain number of gene risks, genetic risks that increase your aging rate, essentially in the cells of your brain. Uh, for example, if you have a, a double allele of ApoE4, we increase your risk fairly substantially. Um, you can have trauma, head trauma, close head injuries, for example, football players and so forth, um, or any other cause of, of trauma. Uh, infections of the brain, whether viral, fungal, you know, uh, bacterial, uh, chlamydial. Um, there are a number of things. Radiation can increase that rate of damage. Um, so a number of things play into cell aging in the brain. If I look downstream, there are a number of things that occur. So for example, as my cells age in my brain, uh, I I will end up with amyloid plaques and tau tangles and mitochondrial dysfunction and inflammatory cell changes, all of which I could go into in detail. But the point is, a number of things happen downstream. Now, if I wanted to prevent Alzheimer's, I could probably just go after beta amyloid, doesn't work. Just go after tau tangles, doesn't work. I could go after both, which might work a little better, but I'm still leaving out a lot of other things. So I'm, I'm sort of doing whack-a-mole. Um, or I could go upstream. And I could say, let's make sure you don't get infections. Let's make sure you don't get trauma. Let's make sure that we fix the genes that uh, increase your risk. Let's do all those things. Again, sort of a whack-a-mole phenomenon. The question is, is there some central point at which there's a, an effective point of intervention that is cheap and, a, cheap and that will do a good job? And the answer is yes. It has to do with changing the pattern of gene expression and telomere length. And even there, I could say, listen, I'm dealing here with a thousand genes, all of which have changed their expression slightly. The epigenetic expression of those genes is a little different. I could use a thousand different treatments, one for each different genetic expression. Or I could use the telomere itself, which modulates all those. Same question. Where is the most effective point of intervention? It's a telomere. It is not that telomeres cause aging. It is not that telomeres cause Alzheimer's. It's not the point. The question is, how can I make it better? That's the point. Very well stated. Um, this I think is a good opportunity for me to bring up a, a couple folks, and I'm going to single out two people, but there's there's many many others. So this is just most recently um, I watched a TED talk, which I can reference here in the link on YouTube um, in the show notes of Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn, who discovered the telomerase enzyme in Tetrahymena in 1984 with her uh, graduate student at the time. Carol Greider, and she mentioned, this This talk was from April 2017, she mentioned that turning up telomerase uh, can cause cancer. Now, maybe I haven't looked hard enough, but I can't find any peer-reviewed scientific research, research that shows in humans turning up telomerase, meaning turning it up more than what it is in somatic cells or other cells, causes cancer. Um, so I don't understand when she says something like that, where she's getting that data from. And something that you mention all the time, Michael, is we have theories, those are great, but show me the data. Um, and before you reply, Michael, an another person that I saw on Dr. Rhonda Patrick's um, YouTube channel from about five months ago, her, her YouTube channel is called Found My Fitness. She was interviewing Dr. Um, uh, Alessa Eppel. I want to make sure I get her name correct. Yeah, I believe that's correct. Um, and yeah, Alyssa, E-L-I-S-S-A. -S -S and she said that long telomeres lead to greater risk for certain cancers like skin cancer or melanoma. She is at UCSF. And she just kind of mentioned this and then <laughs> moved on. So where are these people getting this data from? Because I can't seem to find it. Well, let me start by saying, you know, this began uh, with Judy Campisi's remark about 20, 20 plus years ago about telomeres being, you know, the double-edged sword. Um, and it's, it, you know, there was this trade-off theoretically between cancer and aging. And, and it, the only way to avoid aging was to increase its cancer. And that's where it sort of began, at least on a theoretical basis. Now, since that time, 
the data generally don't support that, but there are individual pieces of the data. And actually, I've got a white paper about this for the FDA. But it, um, it generally involves misinterpretation and some bad data. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, if I'm only measuring the white cells in your, in your bloodstream, and I'm looking at your risk of cancer in your liver, those are two distinct cell populations. And it's not fair for me to ascribe the changes in telomere length over here to what's going on in the cancer over here. What I should be measuring is what's going on in the telomeres of the cancer cells. So there are studies that have looked at it more carefully. And let me put it in perspective first. Um, let me give you a couple of images here. This is, if I look at age-related cancer rates, this is the kind of thing you get, okay? A mouse typically lives about two years and the cancer rate goes up exponentially as it gets older. Now you and I live a lot longer. So here's our, say an 80 year lifespan and our cancer risk goes up exponentially. But if you compress both of those together, you get this graph, which is to say your cancer risk goes up exponentially over your lifespan. It is not, doesn't matter whether you've got a two year species or an 80 year species or 120 year species, the exponential rate goes up. Next question is, why does that happen? Well, part of the problem is this. If you look at what's going on with DNA repair enzymes, there are these four different families. I'm going to make it simple. But all of them, you know, here's the, the first family. It finds a little mutation, a little error in your DNA. And, and every one of us sitting on this, this talk, almost every cell in your body has had some DNA damage while we're sitting here. And one of the things these do is they detect it. So they find it and they say, look, something's wrong. They They've then come in with excision and you pull out the damaged DNA and then you come along and you put in another piece of DNA to replace the missing one. And finally, you sort of knit it into place. Okay, those are the basic four enzyme families. Well, all four of those get turned down with age. And if you look more carefully, you find they get turned down as telomeres shorten relatively. So what you get is this sort of thing. What this says is, look, as your telomeres shorten, as you know, if we're looking at sort of the green line, your telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter, your risk of cancer goes up and up and up. But if it's short enough, the risk of cancer goes down again. You know, the red line falls. And the reason is, those are cells that are in what's called replicative senescence, and they won't divide at all. So you essentially can't have cancer. Now, some of those cells will then slightly increase their telomere length, and then they'll be able to replicate again, which is why you have this peak in cancer right in here. And what that says is, there is a time where if you increase the telomere length, you get an increased risk of cancer because those cells, even though they have a lot of damage um, and they're not repairing the damage, they're still able to divide so you have cancer. Um, but what you find is that if you actually look more carefully, you'll find that the cancer rate then falls if what you do is you actually can increase the telomere length long enough to get to that point where you're actually increasing this ability to repair DNA damage. And that's true no matter what system we're looking at. You no, know, it's, it's actually a lot more complicated than just that. There are a lot of other things going on in these cells. Um, but it's, it's not as simple as just long telomeres cause cancer. Not a bit. In fact, long telomeres are protective if what you're dealing, at, dealing with is the ability to repair DNA damage. So first of all, very excellent explanation, and thank you very much. It seems like we're just kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater with very inconclusive and just poor data um, with some of these folks making this mistake, in my opinion. It's understandable. Um, people like simple answers. And if you look at a very narrow part of, uh, you know, again, if you're looking at a very narrow part of that spectrum in here, um, there is a part where longer telomeres increase cancer risk because they let the cells divide and the cells are already damaged. But it's not that simple any more than aging. As I say, most people think of aging as something that quote, just happens and it's just entropy, it's just wear and tear. No, it's not. That's an important part of it, but it's just not that simple. It all comes back to the ROI, really, the return on investment, the single most important point of intervention. What is that? And you know, the data seems very, very clear and you're a brilliant person that's speaking about this, it's, you know, the telomere length and it's telomerase that can extend the telomeres. That is, bad things happen when telomeres get short is something my friend, Dr. Bill Andrews mentions all the time. And I think that's something that we just shouldn't forget. Let's, sometimes people get distracted. They go off and all over with uh, NAD plus and this and that. 
bad things happen with telomeres get short. Why aren't we doing more to extend the telomeres length? And when I say we, I mean the general population. Obviously, this is what your focus is with telesite. And I want to give you an opportunity to, to share thoughts there. And then I think we should talk about telesite a little bit more and, and what um, you guys are doing there. Let me give you, uh, let me address some of the points you've just raised. I'll, I'll give you the complex, complicated diagram. Okay. Um, this is, this is mostly bears on Alzheimer's. And really what it says is here's the cell senescence part in the middle. Here are all the upstream things that cause the cells to divide or get damaged. And here are some of the downstream things that happen. And you know, downstream, let me give you, see if I can make it a little simpler one too. You know, downstream what you're dealing with is sort of diseases and in this case changes within neural cells. Um, and most people, get back to the complicated diagram, are trying to work down in here trying to deal with things like NAD plus and uh, resveratrol and um, millions of things that occur downstream. And again, some people are concerned more upstream. This is sort of typical modern medicine these days or traditional medicine. Uh, things like avoiding infections, avoiding trauma, having a good diet, reasonable things. But back to your point about ROI, if what you're doing is just treating one of these things, you're not treating the overall problem of age-related disease. What you need is sort of this narrow point in here where you can deal with something that actually causes all of these problems, mitochondrial dysfunction and so on. It's, it's not as easy as that. Here's another way to look at this. Um, this is your, your sort of your standard cell. And you've got mitochondria, and you've got the cell, and you've got the nucleus in the cell. And what you see is that if you look what's going on in cells as they age, you find, for example, that you're actually producing more in the way of reactive oxygen species. Say you're just looking at that, you know, free radicals. And most of the free radicals, about 93% of all free radicals, get produced in the mitochondria. And as you get older, what you find is that the enzymes, the little proteins that are responsible for making this an effective little, little source of power, effective mitochondria, they're all almost all imported from the nucleus, and you've turned down the rate at which they're being imported. So the turnover rate is slowing down. So anytime I go looking for a, a, an enzyme to make power in my mitochondria, I'm not finding as many effective ones. So what you find is the ratio of power production to free radicals begins to go down. You're getting more and more free radicals and less and less actual energy output in the cell, ATP literally. But so you're producing more free radicals. But the next problem is that the, the, end, the little teeny lipid membranes that surround these mitochondria are actually getting leakier as you get older. And the reason is the same. All of those little lipid, lipid molecules in there are produced starting from DNA expression back in the nucleus, and that has been turned down. So they are sitting around longer, they get more damage. Think of the analogy of uh, painting your house once a year versus painting it once every 100 years. You know, if you paint it once every year, it looks pretty good. Paint it every, once every 100 years, you've got problems in those houses. And that's what's happening to these things. Their, their rate of turning over the lipid membranes of painting the house goes down. So the membranes get leakier. So not only are you producing more free radicals, but now they're leaking out of the mitochondria. Now, normally what your cell does is it scavenges them, it traps them, for example, superoxide dispersants. Those are also turned down. Almost every uh, sequestering, trapping molecule that you've got, superoxide dispersants, catalase, almost everything except the ones you eat, are all being turned down, and so they're less effective at trapping. And because you've got leaky membranes now and more free radicals that aren't getting trapped, more of them get back, for example, in the nucleus, so they're causing more DNA damage. So back to that same issue of you know, DNA damage, not only are you not fixing your DNA damage as well, but you've got more of it because your mitochondria are ineffective, your lipid membranes are ineffective, your trapping is ineffective, and that's why cells don't work very well as we get older. And that's why we end up with Alzheimer's disease. Among other things. And correct me if I'm wrong, in your telomerase revolution, your 2015 book, I believe those first two graphs, I believe you showed three, you had the cell in the last one, but those first two are in the book and explained thoroughly, correct? They may be. It's been a while since I put those together. I tend to put new diagrams together whenever I'm trying to explain a concept. I just reread the book last week, so I watch a lot of your uh, lectures and interviews on YouTube as well, too, but I'm almost positive it's in the book. Regardless, another plug for the book, read the book. It's, it's very good, and you can go into so much more depth in the book than we can. Yeah, the, the Wall Street Journal called it one of the best five science books of the year, but that was not enough to pay my mortgage, i got to tell you that. Well, that's we, – we, so let's, let's transition to that then. 
you know, we talked about how, here's what I mentioned. In 1996, when you wrote the book, there's so much phenomenal science in there. It's still, I mean, I don't want to put a number on it, but to me, almost all of it is still very, very correct. There's some small things in there. Like I said, the 100 billion cells. Now scientists seem to think there's about 30 to 40 trillion cells. That's not super important or relevant. My point is, is that it's mind boggling to me how much you knew, and not just you, many people, you're the one that wrote the book, but many other people knew this science 23 years ago, going on 24 years, yet I haven't seen as much done. I want things to get done. I want people to stop dying of age-related diseases that we know about, right? So what can we be doing? You know, obviously you're the one doing this, but what can the audience be doing to help you and Telesite on your mission more? Because I want to see this sped up as much as possible. And I'm, I'm kind of past this day. I've been researching this stuff for 10 to 15 years. I'm only 34, but I'm getting like, let's, let's speed this up. I want this to happen faster. And other people do too. I have people message me all the time and I want to give them action items. People want to participate and help out. What can we do? Well, let me tell you two things that, that we don't have to do. Um, and then the third one that, that is sort of a sticking point. Uh, the first is to understand the concepts involved. Uh, about a year ago, I gave a talk for the Alzheimer's Association in Washington. And afterwards, I got mobbed by people. And that hadn't happened to me before, uh, all congratulating me on what I had to say. And one of the people actually asked me if I'd write up the paper. It turns out he's the editor-in-chief of Alzheimer's and Dementia, the world's preeminent dementia journal. Um, and actually wanted to join our board, which is nice too. Um, now, I wrote the paper, got it back to them this summer. Uh, I've never had editors take me out to dinner before. Uh, usually they're a little more careful with their funds than that, I think. But <laughs> they took me out to celebrate and they said that the paper, quote, will change the field, unquote, um, at the Alzheimer's meeting this summer in LA. Um, and then we, we sent it through eight different reviewers, and I got a remarkably complimentary set of reviews. I don't mean that there weren't any changes, but I was surprised I didn't get more, more difficulty. It's a long paper, uh, but most people felt that it should be shorter, but it should emphasize something else of theirs that they wanted more about. And I couldn't keep increasing it. Um, so we were publishing it as a three-part paper, and then the editors got back to me a couple of weeks ago and said, we want one more change. And I thought, oh God, well, I have to rewrite now. They said, no, no, no. We want you to write an epilogue. We want you to describe the dialogue between yourself and the eight reviewers. What are the things that they found confusing or that they wanted more about? And comment on that. So we now have a four-part paper that's about to come out. And as I say, the editors are very excited about it. They said they put more effort and, 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 and care into this paper than anything else they've put in ever. They're excited about coming out. So I think we understand the concept. It's, it's a novel one. It's difficult for people to grasp, I think but it tells us exactly what we can do. There were 10 questions that they had put out about what a model needed to be to explain not only Alzheimer's, but all other human age-related dementias, plural, including Parkinson's and frontotemporal and Lewy body and vascular. Um, but also uh, answer those questions and offer a technique and a target for what we can do. And I did that in the paper. As I say, that you know, the problem isn't that we don't have targets and techniques. The problem is we didn't have a model to explain what's a good target and what's a good technique to use. Um, now, the second thing that comes up is the FDA. A lot of people are concerned about that. I'm not. I just got back from a, a three-day conference in, in Washington and was talking with the FDA and the people who direct what's called CBER. They're excited about this. They're very supportive of it. They'd like to see this taken even trials. So uh, I think we've, we've got a model. We've got techniques and we've got um, good targets. We've got the FDA behind us as much as they can be. Again, they're not offering us to cut any corners, but they're excited for us to do this. They want us to do it right, as do I. One of the reasons I don't usually give TED Talks and so on, I, I'm not interested in the publicity of this. I just want to get the work done and do it. The third issue, though, still is the funding. And here the problem is that you've got a novel model in a field that has had uniform failures. We've had more than 400 registered FDA tri or registered trials on clin clintrials.gov that have all failed to have any effect on Alzheimer's, honestly. I mean, never mind claims that, that some companies have made without me being specific, but no, there's been no effect. Um, and uh, reasonably enough, many investors are not interested in investing in a field that they see as a, a dead end 
or a graveyard, sometimes called the graveyard of companies, Alzheimer's. Um, and for those who are interested, have a difficult time understanding the model because it's not as simple as just it's beta amyloid. It's not. So it's a difficult model. Um, so over the past three years, we have uh, talked to uh, a lot of potential investors who have either turned us down or not even responded. We currently have more than seven groups who have been actively talking with us, and at least two of those groups have quote, 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 fully committed to funding us through phase one and phase two trials. But a commitment's not enough. We need to actually have the cash to finish going to the FDA and actually run the trial. The biggest problem is gearing up for the material we need for the first trial. The costs fall dramatically after that. But you know, even to run a, a, a phase one human trial, and this is lower than most drug companies would be able to do it, runs us about $10 million. Uh, and the initial cost per head for that treatment per patient is high, but it falls almost immediately. It, to put it simplistically, for me to treat 12 patients, it costs this, for those 12 patients, it cost me a lot, I can then treat about 100 more without any further increase in cost. It's the initial startup that costs money. So our biggest problem, one, has been that people don't understand the model, and two, it's a field that has burned a lot of investors' fingers in the past. And we're still waiting for people to move ahead with the cash we need to get this done. It's quite doable. I know it's doable, and I'm very confident it's going to get done. And I'm hoping that in any way, videos like this will help educate certain people who are interested in this and certain people who don't know about this information at all. It will be new to them, and hopefully they won't have the um, other, in my opinion, incorrect information to cloud their judgment. You know, sometimes people can just come into a new field and leapfrog people who have been into a, a field very long because of their incorrect um, and outdated assumptions that they still cling to. So I, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Yeah, again, back to that same analogy. You know, if this were 1900 and we were investing in, in flight, we would be trying to perfect the, the cloth and the ropes and the heaters in the hot air balloons. And it's the wrong place to start. Yeah, and your analogies are really strong in your interviews and also in your book. So I, I want to plug your book as, again one more time. All three of them are great, but the Salam Race Revolution is the newest one, 2015. And the analogies hammer home uh, the point. We might get into some of those soon. Yeah, that's meant to be a readable book. You know, the, the academic book I wrote in 2004 was academic. As I say, there's you know, almost 5,000 references. It was, it, it was academic book. It's a, it's a medical textbook. Um, but the one, the more recent one is meant for people to be able to read it. Definitely. And so you mentioned a number there a few moments ago, $10 million. And I think you said something like 12 patients. Is that, it would be $10 million for all 12 of those patients to get treated with the telomerase enzyme. Is that correct? Yeah, it actually runs us about $4 million just to produce the gene therapy we need to treat the 12 initial patients. But uh, in doing that, we end up with enough to treat more patients. Um, so it's that, it's that initial hump that after that, things get easy. Um, my, you know, right now, to treat ineffectively, a patient in the terminal year of Alzheimer's in this country runs more than $100,000. Some place is well more than that. And the same thing in the UK. Um, that last year particularly, in full-time nursing care in a, in a basic a hospice, is expensive. Um, and that's without any effect. Those are people who are dying of their Alzheimer's. Um, our, my best napkin calculation, back in the napkin calculation, is that we can actually prevent and cure Alzheimer's disease for well less than a tenth of that. Now, I've been in sales for the last decade or so, um, and elephant hunting is a term that I like to use. And we know that Bill Gates' father right now has Alzheimer's, and Bill Gates is very, very interested in Alzheimer's and how to mitigate or, of course, cure it. So, you know, he's obviously not an easy person to get in touch with, but do you have any idea on if Bill Gates has even heard of Talocyte, if he has shown any interest? Uh, is there anything that you can share? And, and with Bill Gates, maybe other billionaires, people who can come in and quickly change the whole economics of this landscape within just one individual's, you know, decision. 
Yeah, you know, without naming names or or saying anything confidential, let me point out that anybody who's got a lot of money has good gatekeepers. I've always said that you know becoming famous is a disaster. But after that, you don't know who your friends are. Um, but anybody who becomes wealthy and is known to be wealthy has this same problem, and you have to have good gatekeepers. The problem is not that Bill Gates might not understand this and see the value. The problem is that the gatekeepers often don't, and that's not specific to Bill Gates. Um, so we've made some attempts to talk to a number of people, including Gates Foundation, um, and essentially uh, Ben Rabat. And again, it, it's understandable. It's the same problem that people generally have. If you look at the money that the Gates Foundation, that Bill and Melinda Gates just gave to the Alzheimer's Association, that money tended to be aimed specifically at their, it's called the Part the Clouds grant, aimed specifically at diagnostic issues. Well, um, diagnostic issues are not going to cure Alzheimer's disease. This would be like, again, being back in early 19, you know, 50, 1950, 1954, and saying what we need to do is have better diagnostic uh, ability to identify polio victims. No, what we need is a sock vaccine. The problem is that most people, and here I'm talking about gatekeepers as well, um, don't see that. They don't see that as a viable option. They do see diagnostics as a, as a reasonable approach, but it's a dead end. It doesn't help you any more than identifying who has polio and who doesn't. What we need is a cure, and that's doable. Got it. Um, and I think this is also an appropriate time to, to talk briefly about Liz Parrish, BioViva, the other company, IHS. I mean, I view them as uh, partners in our goal to cure human immune and, and cure Alzheimer's. I believe, you know, Liz is a friend of yours. I've, I've interviewed her on uh, my YouTube channel here. You can see the link. Um, I hope that if they're showing progress with their route, which is different than uh, 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 your route, that that will maybe spur more interest and then we can get telecyte to get FDA approval. And that, that could be something that could help out in some way. I'd, I'd just love to hear your, your thoughts on um, how you see them in this whole picture and where it's going right now. Let me start by saying I like Liz. Um, and if we're talking about Bill Andrews, of course, he's been a long-term friend of mine. I've known him for 25 years, more, actually. Um, and, and, you know, I, I remember when Liz was first starting BioViva and we got together in Seattle. I like Liz. In fact, when I was teaching a course on aging, I put in a call to Liz, and I let my students all interview her about what she was doing, because at that point, she had just injected herself. Um, also, let me say that there's a long tradition in medicine of people treating themselves. Um, and in some respects, this is understandable. For me, treating someone else, uh, they may not fully understand the risks, the benefits, the potential of all this, and presumably I do, and therefore treating myself is regarded as somehow ethically a little different. Um, now, let me say two things, though, about those approaches. Um, some of those approaches I'm going to characterize as offshore approaches, although they're not technically offshore in some cases. Um, there are two problems. The first is that um, what, what they are often doing... It, you know, when we run our human trials, we're not only going to not charge people, we'll actually be paying their cost, transportation, housing, a lot of the medical work that we're doing, so it'll be free for them. Um, but they, what they have had a hard time at the same time we have in getting funding. And so one option is to charge people for that treatment. Now, that means that most people who've got Alzheimer's probably can't afford the treatment. Um, on the other hand, that's going faster because they're doing it now. Uh, and you know, if you have the money, you can get something now. Would you rather do that or not have to pay for it and wait two years until I can do it? Well, I understand. That's a it's sort of an ethical trade-off. Um, the other problem, though, bears on the same ethical issue, which is credibility. Um, if I, you know, right now I have a, a sort of a, a private arrangement that when I first announced the results of our human trial, probably in Paris, you know, for next. Um, we'll see. Uh, I expect that somebody in the audience is going to stand up and say, are you claiming you can cure Alzheimer's? And I'm going to tell them, no, I'm not. I'm simply claiming this is my data. This is what we found. Make of it what you will. Um, and the problem is there is way too much spin and hype. I don't think I go more than about two weeks at a time before I see another media article, BBC, C CNN, um, New England, or somebody claiming that they have got a cure for Alzheimer's and it never pans out. So we are not claiming that. 
at least in public, we're certainly not. We're going to claim that we've got the data when we got the data. I think we can cure it, but I'm not here to tell you that it works when I don't know yet. We'll see. But there's a credibility issue. And right now, as I said, there have been more than 400 trials that have failed. And if I were to right now come up with that human data and show that we could take 12 patients and not only stop it, but reverse it, anybody with any sense will not believe that. Uh, or wouldn't blame them. Based on historical precedent, how could they believe that? So I have to be exceedingly careful of what we do. Hence my discussions with the FDA. Hence uh, the way we, we try to avoid publicity in general. Hence a lot of things that we do. And just being very careful. We've you know, chosen the people who do the production. Chosen the people who are doing our FDA consulting on the basis of credibility. Chosen our scientific advisory board. Our scientific advisory board consists of people who have their hands on, to get their hands dirty doing stuff. You know, they run these trials, they consult internationally. They don't just sit and, and write a paper. They're actually doing this work. Um, and none of them are, are uh, chosen because they've got degrees or positions at Harvard. They're chosen because of what they actually really, really do. Credible people, well-respected globally. They run global companies. They run global institutes. Um, so the problem, though, that people will have taking a different approach is that if, if I run four patients in Cartagena or in Bali or in a number of places, um, even in Mexico, when I announce those results, most people won't believe it. And that is most people will unfortunately include the FDA, the NHS, the EMA, the European FDA, uh, major healthcare systems, uh, academic centers. Most people will not believe it. And again, I can't blame them, but it's gonna be a very much uphill battle for somebody to get any credibility when the results were not done sort of in a carefully observed, carefully done manner. So as I say, you've got this balance. You can do it fast and people are dying. And you can, it'll cost more uh, and there won't be credibility, but it's fast. Or you can do it a little more slowly, take an extra two years. Some people will die in the meantime. Uh, on the other hand, I can save a lot more if I get the credibility and people believe that we've done what we can do and it won't cost as much. Well, thanks for sharing all those details. And I just want to share, for me personally, I'm a guy who's just trying to figure this out. And I really appreciate you taking the time to explain all these details. And whoever's going to be watching this, I think, is very thankful as well, too, because, you know, there is a community of people out there that want to help. Um, I don't have any interest in getting famous, as, as you've mentioned before there are downsides to it and I'm starting to see a little bit of them as I make more YouTube videos and interview longevity thought leaders or whatever you want to call it, call it brilliant scientists like yourself. But this is something that I am sacrificing a little bit and I don't want to get on my high horse because it's not, but because um, I think this is just so important. And so I try and stay out of, you know, any judgment from people. I, I think that you are making the best decisions based off your extensive experience to continue this route with Telesite. And I want to support you in every way possible um, and your team. One thing that I do want to mention that I'm not sure you're aware, this is fairly recent news within the last month or so. Um, BioViva, IHS, um, Integrated Health uh, Systems, which is the company that actually does the injections of the uh, gene therapy, Tlonrays, or they have some others. They are now um, doing a free Alzheimer's trial. I think it's five patients. They will be giving the Alzheimer's gene therapy for free. It's about a $62,000 value, $62, USD value that they're stating. Of course, you have to meet very specific qualifications. They don't want somebody at end stage Alzheimer's because that's not a great patient. So get in touch with them if you're if you're interested in that. But I don't know if you're aware of that, but that they have kind of changed their position on that recently. Yes, actually it was. Okay. Okay. Do you think that that's you don't have to comment, but I'm just curious. You don't have to comment if you don't want to, but do you think that's in a better route? Because it seems to be important to you that folks you know, don't have to pay for this at this early stage before it is proven, because it's not proven yet. It's still theory right now, right? Yes. Um, you know, the, the logic is almost irrefutable. The data supports it throughout. The negative data supports it as well. That is what's failed so far. For example, you know, if I look at the Eli Lilly trial or the Biogenesi trial, I predicted their results before they came out. Um, even the recent 
attempt in Biogen to rework the data, sort of cherry pick the data. Um, you know, the data is hard to get away. It's hard to envision any other way for this to work than the model that, as I say, is about to be published in Alzheimer's and Dementia Journal. Um, the major concerns that I still have are the ethics of it, and that involves things like the cost, uh, but also the risks and the efficacy. Um, this is the sort of thing that has to be done very carefully. You know, the, the first gene therapy trial, actually not quite the first, but close to it, almost 20 years ago, 20 years ago this year, actually, uh, resulted in a human death. Um, it is very easy to make a mistake with this, and it is very difficult to do it right. And it's one of the reasons that, you know, we put out bids for our gene therapy, and we actually chose the highest, the highest bidder, but it's not the cost that was concerned, it's the safety and the credibility. We want this done right. There are a number of people who can put things like this together in their lab uh, on their campus. But again, it's a question of, have you done it carefully enough that you're not gonna introduce um, problems, let's just say adverse effects, uh, and that it's gonna actually work. And it's a very, very delicate thing to do this right. You are changing the expression of genes in people's brains and elsewhere. And it is very easy to get it wrong. Got it. Okay. That's really helpful. And I really appreciate it. Uh, I do want to mention real briefly, there's a show my wife and I just watched last week, Unnatural Selection on Netflix, um, five episodes. I encourage the audience to check it out if you have Netflix. It just kind of shows where we are with gene therapy. The show was, I believe, filmed in late 2017, and it shocked me. And I, I follow, you know, gene therapy news and stuff. I'm no expert, but I, I follow it and, and interview folks like yourself. And there are people doing this in their garages, being shipped all over the country. It's It was really an eye-opening thing to me. So... I think that regulators are somewhat aware of this. They touch upon that in the show, but we're hitting this critical point where um, it needs to be done in a setting of, of telesite where it's controlled in so many ways or uh, desperate folks could do desperate things, you know? Well, it, again, it's not that simple, but you know, okay. it, it, you know, when you think about the job, for example, that the FDA or the EMA or the N NMPA in China have, it, You've got a balance between getting drugs out that are effective as fast as possible and preventing things that are actually going to kill people. And it's, it's not an easy balance. It's so easy to get it wrong, get things out quickly that actually kill people or delay things that actually will make people better. And neither of those is appropriate. And that's the sort of issue that comes up with this, too. You know, the, the FDA just fired off a number of warning letters to people who are sending uh, or selling stem cells in stem cell clinics. And the same thing will happen with regard to gene therapy. On the one hand, I understand that. You do want to make sure that this is safe and that it works. People aren't just getting snake oil. On the other hand, you don't want to slow down the advent of medical care. You know, if we had, if we had been very careful 200 years ago about medical care and, and, and just tried to stick with what we knew, we would now have the best bloodletting techniques, the best enemas on the planet. <laughs> what we wouldn't have are things like polio vaccines. Um, so it is a balance, and I think that's part of what's going on when you look at, at things that Bill and, and, and Elizabeth Parrish are doing. It is not that they're unconcerned about safety. I don't mean to imply that. But, you know, the, the question is, how do you get the optimal safety and efficacy as quickly as possible? And those are trade-offs, and they are very difficult trade-offs. I don't know the answer. Okay, well stated. I appreciate it. Um, I just want to, uh, you know, plug real quick, share this video with friends, family on your social media. Um, you know, do your part. If you're sitting there and you're wondering, you want to help out in some way. Obviously, if you're wealthy, get in touch with Michael um, Telesite and contact him on LinkedIn. We'll have links in the show note. Uh, so, you know, quick plug on that. Any other uh Thoughts that you want to share just on um, how people can help uh, Tillicide's mission? No, but you know, putting it bluntly, I think we can demonstrate a, a, an effective cure for not only Alzheimer's but other human dementias. But we can first identify that and demonstrate it within 24 months. Okay, brilliant. Um, I want to switch it up a little bit and something that you were talking about earlier at the very beginning of this video conference was. Um, kind of about physics. And I've heard you mention, you know, other interests that you have uh, in other interviews. 
And so one question that I have for you is, this might be a curveball. Do you think, or what, what is your best guess on whether or not reality, what we call reality, meaning everything that we can measure in the known universe, and I'll even include multiverse theory, everything that we're studying, physics tells us about, what, do you, what are the chances that this is a simulation, an artificial simulation? Have you looked into that at all? I wouldn't say I looked into, but like a lot of people, I've thought about it. And part of the question goes down to what do you mean by simulation? You know, as you probably know, um, there are models that suggest that entire universe is sort of a simulation in, in a sense, you know, four-dimensional space-time, but based on a lot smaller dimensions. And it's sort of, a, as it were, a, um, an image uh, that we live in. But, you know, it's actually more com compact than that. Um, so in that sense, you could say we're living in a simulation. Um, it's certainly possible that I, I've sometimes said, you know, I have no way of knowing that reality even is there. I, I see a reality. I accept it. I don't know that the universe wasn't created 2.6 seconds ago, complete with all my memories of it. It doesn't matter. I don't see the point for me, day-to-day -day life, in worrying about it either way. Um, I was saying actually to someone this morning that if you just want to be, I sometimes say reality is highly overrated. Um, because the reality is that we are in some sense here to, to make babies and we're all going to die and probably suffer. Well, you can look at the world that way if you want to, but it's not a very pleasant way to look at it. I prefer to look at it with considerably more nuanced view um, and enjoy mostly what I can and see what I can do to improve parts that I don't enjoy much and that I might be able to fix. So the fact that the universe might be a simulation doesn't bother me one bit. I love your answer, and I feel generally about the same way. Um, that's why I read your preface earlier, because I thought that that language you use um, showed so much of the importance of your general mission, which is compassion. Compassion is a word that you've used many times within the book and other interviews that I've seen of you, and I think that we shouldn't get lost on that, and that if we understand where the true most important point of intervention is here for treating aging and age-related diseases than continuing to have that um, thought process focus on compassion is very important. And I, I think that we probably are in a simulation from what I've researched on. And then when I tell people that, most people freak out. Uh, but it doesn't affect anything. Uh, my parents are still my parents. My wife's still my wife. She's about to have her baby soon. It uh, doesn't matter. It's just uh, we still have to march on. I just think it could be a better way of thinking about things. If, if everything's digital, it's, to me, it's a message of empowerment that we can figure things out. We can solve difficult problems. We can cure human aging or at least you know, live much, much longer with a healthy, uh, extend our health span is what I think. So. We can, but we can only, again, do that if we actually think about it. And, and work on it. So that one was supposed to be fun. And tied into that, I love the quote, um, the mind is like a parachute. It only works if it's open. And you're a person who has an open mind. And I want to just, everybody who's watching right now, whether you believe anything about telomeres, swan rays, whatever you came in here, preconceived, just all I ask is try and keep an open mind and focus on the data. That's something that Michael's very good at and has explained. The data is what matters. Michael, can you please sh share a little bit about uh, yeah, you know, I, your students? I used, to, I used to say this to my residents and my graduate students. Um, theory and logic are good. They're really good. You want logical theories. You want things well thought out. But data trumps every time. And what does the data show about uh, telomeres and, and telomeres, just briefly? I know we've touched upon it, but since, you're, since you mentioned it. Again, if you look at the data carefully and, and are thoughtful about what the data means and don't misconstrue it because you're not paying attention, um, as I say, measuring the wrong cells at the wrong time, um, it supports the model. That doesn't prove the model is right. It proves that so far the model is consistent with what we know about reality. It's probably right. I'm pretty sure it's right. But again, <clears throat> You know, when I take the first 12 human patients with moderate Alzheimer's disease and show that I can actually improve them to the point where they're actually better memories, better, better capable of functioning, then I've proven my point. Got it. Love it. Um, 
Quick question. I know, I know you've mentioned this in other interviews relatively recently regarding you know, certain pills to take. We'll get into maybe other uh, overall health things we can be doing. But right now, personally, I'm taking um, Isogenics Isogenesis. It's a product that's been developed in partnership with uh, Dr. Bill Andrews and the Sierra Science Research and also TAM 818 through a company called Defy Time. Also, you know, partnership. Bill and Sierra scientists want to stay focused on their work, but um, those are telomerase activators. According to Bill Andrews, what he said he's measured at Sierra Sciences, he's shown that those actually do induce telomerase, the enzyme in, in human cells. Now it is very, very weak, um, you know, maybe anywhere from five to 16% or so at most. That's not going to cure aging. Uh, people have been taking TA65 since around 2006, and those people don't appear to be dramatically, you know, younger uh, from appearances. Like, for example, there's no 60 year olds turned into 20 year olds from there. So uh, I think it's important to have a mindset of your own personal ROI on this, how much money you have and be responsible. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on those telomerase enzyme um, inducer products right now and what you think about that. Well, let me comment on them uh, sort of generically. Um, you know, I, I'm aware of three peer-reviewed papers that we actually published in, in Rejuvenation Research. Um, and I started, I think, when I was still the editor. Uh, but there are at least three papers out there, and they show exactly what you say, which is that there's a certain amount of activity that suggests that, for example, the immune function is uh, younger than it was before you started taking a, a tolerance activator. Uh, but none of those people, it's not true that anybody, as you say, is 70 and look like they're 20 now. It's just that if you measure, for example, a T cell function or other parts, you know, bone mass, you actually see some changes that suggest that there's a significant improvement. Um, and that's consistent with the kind of thing that Jaron found and that Bill found at Sierra Sciences. Um, but that's really all we have so far. And that question about, you know, who should be taking them, back to your point about the ROI. If, as I've sometimes said to people, let's assume for a second that they work. The question, and, and again, the data supports that, but not impressively, but there's an effect, pretty much sure. Um, let's assume that, that that's true. That's still a question of how sick you are and how much money you have. And if I'm 20 years old and I'm, um, I have no money, I wouldn't think of taking it. If I'm 80 years old and I have some health problems related to age and I'm a billionaire, I'd definitely be on it. But I don't know many people who are true either way. You know, most of us are sort of, other lots of scattered ages and have lots of different scattered amounts of money, some a little bit, some a lot, but not, a, you know, it's a difficult question. Um, if it were free, I would take it. Leave it at that. Great answer. Um, there, there's a cyclo, there's many cycloestrogenol or cycloestrogenol, however you pronounce it, and astragalicide type products on Amazon, on the internet. It's kind of a mess of how to figure this stuff out. Yeah, that's your other problem. You don't know what you're getting. Right. And that's that. I did spend some money on those a few years ago, and I've spoken with Bill, and I've listened to more interviews of yourself. And I just want to share with the audience just be really careful. You know, there are some trusted products out there. I'll mention obviously TA65. I personally trust Bill Andrews and Defy Time with TAM818 that he's doing the research he says he's doing. Um, and that it is inducing telomerase, and same with the isogenics isogenesis. This is just me talking, but um, I trust Bill, and that's where I'm figuring this stuff out. You know, Noel Patton owned TA65, uh, TA Sciences, and sold TA65. I think he's a reliable source. I don't know that that's true, but yeah, I believe it. Bill Andrews, I feel the same way. Whatever Bill stands behind, I believe. But it doesn't mean I'm right, but I believe Bill, and I believe TA Sciences. Um, there are a lot of other sources out there, as you say, all over the internet and Amazon. Some of them are probably honest, some of them probably aren't, and I have no way of telling the difference. And neither do I. And when I reached out to Bill a few years ago, I believe this is 2015, I said, hey, can you test this cycloestrogenol product that I just bought? He said, yeah, I can. It's going to be about 4000 bucks." And I thought, eh, I'll probably just not do that and instead just buy Isogenics and TA65. And so that's the decision that I made because this stuff is expensive to test to test for Bill, and he doesn't want to waste his time on it, and I, and I understand. So, 
Um, okay, well, thanks for that. Moving on, I thought we'd do something fun real quick. I'm going to name some some names of some anti-aging folks, um, and if you don't know who they are, that's totally fine. I assume you probably will for the people that I name, and would love to just hear your thoughts. You can give a one answer, you can say no comment, you can answer however you want. So um, very soon, uh, probably in early December 2019, um, I'll be interviewing Dr. Greg Fahey, um, who's kind of runs a recent trial that's got all the you know, a lot of people in the longevity movement on the internet all excited. Um, what What do you think about what he's shown uh, in your in your opinion and in, in the research? And maybe you all, I bet you mean you're going to interview him in 2020 and not 2019. Just a guess. Um, but did I say January? I meant uh, early December 2019. So in oh, a, okay. so yeah. it is still 2019. We're scheduling to do the interview. Yeah. Um, I like Greg. I can send a, a spent, a have spent, you know, very pleasant evening with him over dinners. Um, but as to what he's doing these days, I, I, um, I have to say, I don't, let me just pretend I don't know as much as I should. Leave it at that. Probably true. I'll share what I know about it real quick. And um, so I think from a one year trial of about nine men, they took a few um, drugs, metformin, a few other things. Uh, and it showed about a 2.5 age reversal from their DNA methylation, which I think you'll agree is the most accurate way to measure biological aging right now. But that does not mean that telomeres are not actually theoretically a better measurement of one's biological age. It just means that we don't have the technology to measure telomeres as well as the DNA methylation. No. I, I would disagree with DNA methylation being the primary way of doing this. Okay. What do you think is the best way to measure someone's biological age currently right now? Let's just say there's no good way. There are expedient ways, but there aren't good ways. Um, I'll give you an example. If I really want to measure your age, what I would do is measure the gene expression, the gene expression um, pattern of every gene in, your, in all your cells. And I'd compare that to what it was when you were, say, 20, and I'd look at the changes in gene expression. Because the, the difference between me at age 9 and me right now at age 69 is the pattern of gene expression. It is not really anything else. It's the pattern of gene expression that determines everything. Now, I can't do that. Um, you can try to come close to that with methylation, but even methylation doesn't reflect the full epigenetic pattern. It just doesn't. It, it's, uh, for one thing, it's not just a matter of methylation. There are other parts of epigenetics that matter. Um, the second thing is um, you, you can't always measure the cells you want to. Example, um, when we do our Alzheimer's trial with the FDA, what I would love to do and I will not do and I cannot do would be to measure your telomere lengths in the cells in your brain. That would involve brain biopsy. I'm not going to do that. No interest in doing that. On the other hand, what I can easily measure is, for example, telomere lengths in your circulating lymphocytes. Um, but... Those are a different cell population, and they have their own problems. I've written an article about why that's an inappropriate measure in almost all cases. Um, so, you know, if I really want to assess your aging or your reversal of aging, in the case I'm looking at with Alzheimer's, I don't have a good cell that I can get at that's reliable for this. And when I measure it, the best measure, if I do it, is probably telomeres. But even then, people measure the wrong cells, they use the wrong technique for doing it, and then this is the results. So, bottom line is, um, no, I'm completely unimpressed by just measuring methylation. It's a, it's a red herring. And are there aren't any better real ways to do it that are practical. Theoretically, telomere links. Theoretically, even better, the actual pattern of gene expression, not methylation, but the pattern of expression. And I can't really do either in any practical clinical way that bears on patient outcome. Very, very well stated. Um, and I believe that I've seen you in other interviews state that life length and What's now, I think they've rebranded the Tilo years uh, in Mountain View, California, Bay Area, are the two companies that if you do, if you're so inclined to get your telomeres measured, um, that, that you recommend, is, is that accurate? That's still true. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother. I mean, I've had mine measured because somebody was doing it for free as part of studies that they had me involved. But I have no interest in it. And again, let me give you a flavor for why that's a problem. One is there are technical problems. It's very difficult to get those measurements right. Two is a lot of people, and I've seen so many papers, I've had a review on this, um, are measuring average telomere length. When the average telomere length is not the point, it actually is the shortest telomere length, but it's more appropriate 
uh, measure of cell aging. The next one is that, you know, not only are there technical problems in doing it, and then they measure the wrong thing, because it's cheaper to measure average than to measure shortest, but they'll measure lymphocytes, and those lymphocytes don't represent, for example, uh, you know, um, don't represent what's going on in my coronary arteries or my chondrocytes in my knees or my glial cells in my brain. It would be like saying, uh, I want to know whether you've got uh, osteoarthritis, so I'm going to measure how gray your hair is. Well, there's a relationship there, but hair is not the knee. It's true, the grayer your hair is, the more likely you are to have osteoarthritis, but they're not related except just correlation. The same is true if I'm measuring lymphocytes and trying to assess body aging, wrong measure. I'm looking at one little teeny piece of it. It's sort of like measuring how old people are in New York and trying to imply that, that understand the average population of the world. No, that's the average population of New York. The other problem though, is that there is a continual turnover of these cells and that turnover is determined partly by what I'll call stress. So example, if I, if I have average telomere lengths in my marrow of say uh, nine kilobase pairs, and normally what would happen is the circulating lymphocytes might have pretty close to nine. But now uh, I undergo a messy divorce. I've just recently had a, a terrible viral infection. You've shot my dog. I've gotten fired from my job. On and I'm starving to death and I don't know what else my telomere lengths are going to be very short. And the reason is because I'm churning them over peripherally. They're dividing even peripherally. And you divide, some, of the, some cells, depending on which ones you're looking at, divide centrally, some divide peripherally. But that can change too. So if I'm undergoing stress, I'm going to find that suddenly I look a lot older. But if I now resolve the stress, my, my spouse comes back to me. I've got a brand new job with more pay. I've got a better dog. I've gotten over my viral infection. I've taken up meditation. I've got a, a good diet. You name it. I've moved to Samoa, I don't care what, but suddenly life is good. If I measure telomere lengths, they will have gotten longer. But not because my body is younger, but because the, the transient stresses have gone away. So if all I'm doing is measure peripheral lengths, and I resolve what I think of as peripheral or environmental issues, it'll look like I'm getting younger, but I haven't. My marrow cells are still slowly getting shorter. Very good explanation. I had my telomeres measured at life length in 2013 when I was 28, and I learned a lot from it, but I ended up spending about $1,000 because I had to go see, part of getting that done, I had to go see an anti-aging doctor in San Francisco, and I had to pay him as well, too. So, I mean, as you just stated all the details, I wouldn't recommend it to folks, especially if they aren't very wealthy and don't have the money and time, but I did learn a lot from getting that report and it showed really good um length for me so that was good to know but i was only 28 so i wouldn't expect them to be low anyways at that point so um well thanks for sharing all those details so um let's let's move on to maybe the next one um dr aubrey gray i uh, interviewed him a few months ago he's well respected well known in the industry uh general thoughts on, on what the sins research and foundation aubrey gray are doing at this point Aubrey started out uh, believing that the mitochondria were the cause of aging, and um, they're not any more than beta amyloid is the cause of Alzheimer's disease. Now, he slowly, in the past 20 years, come around to the idea that cell senescence plays a role. He didn't believe it when, first, when we first talked about this 20 years ago, but he's getting there. But Aubrey is still caught up in the senolytics issue. And it is. Um, Again, a red herring, I uh, could get into it, but uh, people are gonna be very disappointed in that. It's in some ways the darling of the investment community right now, but um, it's just gonna run into some clinical problems. Let's, if it's okay with you, let's get into it real briefly. I mean, again, this is in the spirit of, we're all trying to cure aging, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on, um, you know, as, as brief as you'd like, um, you know, why you think they're going to run into clinical issues. Because I, I, I agree with you, and uh, we all want to be investing our time, money, and energy on what's going to cure aging and Alzheimer's and age-related diseases as quickly as possible. Well, let me first, uh, let me first make the case for senolytics. It would go something like this. Uh, let's take a typical knee joint, and you've got a lot of chondrocytes in the knee, and some of those chondrocytes are very functional, and some of them aren't. Some of them uh, have cell senescence characteristics. They've changed their pattern of gene expression. They've changed the sort of molecules that they're putting out in the local environment. And in fact, 
they're in some ways acting like uh, sociopaths. They're the, the neighborhood uh, bully, in a sense. They're causing problems in the neighborhood um, in a chemical sense, uh, as well as not being as functional as they should. They're actively dysfunctional, not just passively dysfunctional, but actively causing problems for neighboring cells. So the argument would be, let's find a way to kill off the senescent cells, remove them. Because the argument would be that therefore, those cells will no longer be interfering with the function of neighboring cells. And so the tissue, in this case, the knee joint, uh, would be um, more functional. In short, you could maybe resolve osteoarthritis, would be the argument. The problem is this. The problem is that if I remove those cells that are senescent, I'll give you the theoretical issue first, and then I'll give you an analogy, and then I'll give you the data. But the theoretical would be, if I remove those senescent cells that, granted, are actively causing damage, um, I will then be left with a, a, a smaller number of cells the response of the neighboring cells that are not senescent or as senescent will be to divide or replace the missing cells, and that will accelerate their rate of senescence. So they will now be much more, much closer to the same sort of senescent dysfunction than they were before. So while you've removed senescent cells, you've already you've also accelerated senescence in the remaining cells. Now, here's sort of the analogy of this. Now, the analogy is this. I've got a village in Liberia five years ago it has 10% uh, of the patients have Ebola. And I have two options. I can, and this has happened in some villages, I can kill all the patients who have Ebola because I'm afraid of getting infected. And then other patients will end up getting with Ebola. And in fact, because I've killed them, I may be exposed and now I've got Ebola. That's sort of a senescent approach, a senolytics approach. You're doing is killing the, the bad agents. Uh, our approach would be to say no, simply immunize and cure the patients who have Ebola, so now everybody's healthy. Rather than removing senescent cells, we would simply reset the pattern of gene expression. So instead of having, say, 10% of cells that are senescent and causing active inflammation or active dysfunction to neighboring cells, now all of those cells are acting like 20 year old chondrocytes. Um, now, the data actually shows this too. If you look carefully at some of the published data on senolytics, what you find is that, in fact, there is an improvement clinically. Things look better for a while, and then there's a steepening curve as you look at the onset of pathology. Um, yeah, you know, I think what you're seeing is just the beginning hints of that. And when we take this to human clinical trials, what you will frankly see is that somebody, for example, with osteoarthritis, will find that there's an initial improvement. I think of it as a honeymoon period, followed by a, a rapid exacerbation, an acceleration of the pathology. Very well stated. Uh, I really appreciate you giving that in-depth explanation. And, you know, I, I did bring this up briefly when I interviewed uh, Aubrey de Grey in July of, of this year about, uh, when I say this, I mean, I brought up this long risk caused cancer. And he's still worried that, for example, if you believe that Liz Parrish did inject herself with this long range gene therapy, as she says she did, and, and I believe she did, then he's worried that she's going to get cancer and uh, at some point down the road. And I'm not nearly as worried about that. Um, and I don't believe you are as well either from, from what you mentioned earlier. And he, at least at the time, is, still is. And I believe he still is now too. So um, all I said is I'm at least glad that Liz has now done what she's done. And hopefully we'll have more data on this. I'd, I'd like to get more people with this long race gene therapy sooner rather than later. So we have more and more data and we can really figure out what the truth is. But um, I appreciate you sharing all those details there. You're welcome. Um, Dr. Michael West, uh, I was at RadFest last month. He's incredible. I couldn't find the guy. I mean, RadFest, I want to give a real quick plug on RadFest. There, there's downsides to it, which I, I think you haven't mentioned RadFest, but there are people in the longevity movement that are saying things like, you're going to live forever and this and that. I don't believe you're one of those people. I'm not one of those people. I've never said that. People say like, oh, you think you're going to live forever? And I'm like, I've never said that. I, I, all I'm interested in is increasing people's health spans and their lifespans based off real data, talking to really smart <laughs> people like yourself on how we can do that. And you'll have some of those people like that at RadFest, but I'll say in general, they mean well. And people are trying to bring everybody together. Um, Dr. Michael West gave an incredible uh, presentation at RadFest, and I 
couldn't find him in the hallway to introduce myself and interview him. So I, I hope to interview him on this channel at some point. Stay subscribed. That's my little spiel on that. Dr. Michael West, share your thoughts, please. Michael is one of the brightest people I know. Um, it's always a pleasure talking with him because we can talk about anything from the Roman Empire to uh, derivation of odd words to biology and have a great time discussing it. Um, it's funny you say you couldn't find him because um, at Jaron, there was a map in the back hall of the world. And what it said on top was, where is Michael West? <laughs> because no one could find him. You never knew whether he was in Copenhagen or Los Angeles or just down the hall or in the bathroom. And I had no idea. Um, he was always sort of gone. So I'm not surprised you couldn't find him either. There's a theory that he actually goes from black hole to black hole and just moves around as well a simulation of the universe. No one knows. Um, Mike, Mike and I had a great time years ago I, you know, I, and specifically telecyte, I generally, though, try to avoid longevity and anti-aging meetings because I need to be very careful about credibility so when we get the data, people believe it. Because, again, some of the people at some of these meetings um, have, you were talking about open mind, they have such an open mind that the brain falls out. <laughs> you know? uh, and yet, you know, I like a lot of these people. Uh, you know, they're nice people, but it, it's hard to sometimes not only maybe for me to take them seriously, but for people like the FDA or investors to take them seriously. And I need to be careful. Um, but Michael and I had a great time once at a meeting that you would know about if I mentioned, back 20 years ago, wandering around a, a, a big convention hall in uh, Las Vegas, which gives part of it away. Um, and we remember saying to each other that what we ought to do is literally sell snake oil. Get a booth and sell snake oil as something that would reverse aging instantly and make you young forever. The problem that Mike and I both had is that we knew that neither one of us could possibly keep a straight face. So the, the only way possibly we could have done this would have been to hire an actor or an actress to stand there and do this for us because we would have just cracked up. That's Michael, interesting guy, I like him. Yeah, he's phenomenal. I hope to interview him on this YouTube channel, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. Uh, I didn't even get a chance to introduce myself to, to Michael in the hallway. There's so many people there. and I never want to interrupt somebody when they're talking to somebody else. I just think that's disrespectful. So he doesn't even know who I am. But that's hilarious. I have to mention real quick, because this is just too crazy. Um, I don't know if you've heard of this. Vice News did a story about seven years ago, and they've since done some updates on a gentleman who's now, I believe, 52 years old here in 2019. He's been injecting himself, himself with snake venom for many years, uh, over 20 years now, I believe. And he had his telomeres measured, I think seven or eight years ago, around 2012. And he had very long telomeres, the telomeres of a 28 year old. As, as you've already mentioned, you know, it doesn't show exactly his, his biological age, but uh, he looks, I think, very young for his age. And it, apparently the nobody go out and inject yourself with snake in them. That's not what I'm, that's not what I'm saying here, but Apparently from him injecting himself with fresh snake venom, he has the snakes, he you know squeezes the venom out, he injects a small amount, he started off microdosing when he first started and then scaling up. It's apparently had anti-inflammatory effects on him and I'll let people, you can search, I'll put a link in the show notes here, but it's just one of those things where it shows the universe and life and reality and biology is so incredible. Because there seems to be something to it, but again, do not go out and start doing this. He tells people not to do this. He tells people he's a little bit crazy. He doesn't know why he's doing it, but uh, he, he's, this is real. How, have you heard of this, and how crazy is this? Let me, let me make an odd comment here, which is that um, it, it's back to what I said about you know my residents and the, and the grad students. The theory is one thing, and, and data is another. And, you know, it... If I thought that a lot of things were nonsense, but you've got good data that it works, it works. I'm just going to have to reassess my theory. And most crazy ideas are crazy. Most innovative ideas are wrong. That's, you know, that's the sort of thing investors wonder about with, when we're talking about telomerase therapy. Most innovative ideas simply don't work. However, let me give you an historical example. Back in about 1900, I forget when I first ran into this, but so I'm not sure the date, but around 1900, there was a physician, general practice physician in Kansas, who was successfully treating his elderly pneumonia patients with a bread mold he grew in his kitchen. Now, 
red mold is where you get penicillin. And it's pretty likely he was growing his own penicillin and curing his elderly penicillin or pneumonia patients um, with penicillin, homegrown. However, uh, the medical community knew that he was a nut because it's just red mold for God's sake. I mean, this is stupid, right? Yeah. Uh, so he lost his license, was drummed out of the medical career, and, and moved out of state. No one knows what happened to him. Happened to him. But the point I'm making is that sometimes crazy people are right. So sometimes, it, you know, he could have been the Fleming of, of the century before Fleming got to inventing or discovering penicillin. Uh, that's not what happened. Everybody knew he was a nut. Some people really are nuts. Uh, you know, most new crazy things are nuts. Sometimes they're not. And it's very hard to tell the difference. Yeah, that's great points. Uh, there, there is a gentleman who lived to, I think, 100 or 101 years old who was injecting himself with snake venom for many years. He was a like a zookeeper or something. He was something like that down in Florida. Uh, I remember researching this back then in like 2012. So it's, it's pretty crazy. It's kind of a side note here, um, but it just kind of shows how crazy this, this world is and how things that make you go, hmm. Um, so we already mentioned Ed Park. I had him here on the list. Uh, he's a, become a, a friend of mine. He's a great person, uh, and he's running his anti-aging practice there. And the reason I bring him up is because he's been um, injecting some of his patients with exosomes this year from Chimera Labs. And I have interviewed Chimera Labs founder, Dr. Duncan Ross. And they seem to be getting pretty phenomenal results. These are anecdotal, right? It's early stage. Um, but it's something I'm interested in. And so it kind of can answer in any way that you want. But I had stem cells injected uh, in me in Mexico in December of last year. I've documented it pretty thoroughly on my YouTube channel. I believe I've gotten dramatically better because of that. Could it be placebo? Sure. Is placebo involved? Definitely. Because I, it made me feel more positive from doing it. But in general, what do you think about um, exosomes, stem cells, Dr. Ed Park, anything else you want to chat about? Let me say something about exosomes as an example. There is um, there's a tendency to separate these things out in some respects without realizing that it's a spectrum. Um, at the one end, we can take things like liposomes, little basically bags of fat that you can put things in. You can even make targeted liposomes. At another extreme, you've got viral vectors, for example, AAV9 or lentiviruses. And what these are is little bags of something with something inside them little bags or something with something inside them. But, you know, these ones uh, we take from viruses and we can manipulate them. These ones we may make in the lab and manipulate them. But they're really little bags, little biological bags with something important in them. And in between those are things like exosomes. In all cases, uh, you're looking again at a spectrum. They're, they're actually similar in many ways, at least conceptually. And what I mean is there's something on the outside the bag itself, use it with some addressing molecules. For example, in the viral vector, it may say, go to your nasal passage, go to your lungs, go to your kidneys, go to your liver. With the liposomes, you can target it again to go to various cells, exosomes likewise. And then there's the important part in the inside. I sometimes think of it as the envelope and the letter. There's the envelope that says where to go in the body, and the letter on the inside says, here's the news, here's what I want you to do once it gets there. Um, but these are all a spectrum. And to, to, to magically think of exosomes as exosomes, because they're exosomes, is to miss the point, which is, the question is, what works? And we know targeted viral vectors can work in certain cases. We know targeted liposomes can. We're pretty sure exosomes can. The question is, what works? But these are not, it's not that they're different because they're exosomes. It's, it's a continuum here. Here's another example. People get really excited about nanomachines. The difference between a nanomachine and a cell conceptually is not much. The main difference is that most nanomachines, at least the ones we've built so far, are not capable of self-maintenance and self-replication. If they did, they would essentially be cells. Um, nanomachines in many ways are not much different than cells. We're often in love with the title nanomachines, as though we can inject you with nanomachines and therefore cure your coronary artery disease. Maybe, but not because they're nano nanomachines, but because they work or don't. And the same is true whether you're using viral vectors or anything else. Nanomachines are no more than little teeny constructs of life that are much simplified from cells, but they have many of the same problems. As I say, if they're not self-maintaining, then they're going to go away. If they're not self-replicating, we will end up losing them. Um, 
But there's nothing magical about calling something an atom machine or an exosome. The question is, what is it really doing? Does it do it? Well stated. What do you think, exosomes? I mean, do you think that people... I don't know. Exosome. Okay, gotcha. And again, it's like saying viral vector. Um, you know, I can take a viral vector uh, that will go in and transiently express something and then go away. I can take another one that will insert in your chromosomes, and there's some risks in that and some benefits to that. And the real question is, does it work? What's the safety? What is the efficacy? Same thing is true the exosomes. There's no generic answer. Exosomes are all good. Exosomes are all bad. Show me the exosome. Show me what you're doing with it. Show me the data. Interesting. And, and I learned something last year. It showed that uh, exosomes in a healthy body are about 2 billion um, exosomes in a healthy human adult body. And a healthy and an adult body that has cancer has about 4 billion exosomes. So I thought that was just interesting that the body is producing more of them. And then the question is chicken and the egg. Like, is it producing more of them to fight the cancer or is it part of the cancer? It's just, and I don't know that answer. I don't, you can comment if you'd like, but. No, I don't know either. I don't know the data is great. I haven't seen the data, don't know. And as you say, even if I saw the data, I wouldn't know what it really meant, which way it was. You know, <laughs> correlations like that are impossible to deal with. Example. Um, if I want to correlate what you eat with uh, coronary artery disease, what I'm trying to predict is, will you get a heart attack in the next year? If I measure everything that people buy in a grocery store, every single thing they buy, every food that they buy, and I correlate it with their risk of heart disease, what I will discover, lo and behold, is that baby food is apparently protective against heart attacks. But it's not because it's protective. It's because people who buy baby food tend to be 25-year-olds with their first baby. 65-year-olds don't buy baby food. So baby food is not protective. It's simply a correlation. And it's understandable once you figure out why people buy baby food. You know, people with heart attacks tend not to buy baby food. People who don't get heart attacks tend to be the ones buying baby food. Um, so when I see things like exosomes, again, I don't know what it means. But so far, all we've got is, if, it, if the data is right, all you've got is a correlation. Don't know. Could be anything. Great example. Um, so we're still on people. Uh, Maria Blasco. I like her tons. Um, I had a private deal with her, which is that if we pull this off, I want her to get the Nobel Prize for it. I don't want it. Um, she deserves it. Um, she's done a lot of the basic work. Uh, and oftentimes, people in academia don't understand the implications of what she's done. Um, and they should. Uh, she is my mind, uh, head and shoulders above almost any other scientist I know in this field in any way. And I include people who have won a Nobel Prize for this. And just so the viewers know, she's in Madrid and she's involved with LifeLink. I, I believe she's a, a founder or co-founder of LifeLink. Yes. Yeah. Um, she was a collaborator of ours for a while. Um, and it, if we go ahead and move ahead with the funding, we will be collaborating with her again and funding some of the work she does. But yes, she is superb. Okay, just because you brought up funding, I, I don't want to miss this question. Um, you've mentioned in other interviews, you know, around 1999 or so, turn of the millennia, you can tell us the exact date. You were very close, in fact, the night before from getting a billion dollars from a couple, a very wealthy couple in California. I think you've mentioned they were maybe the, self, the seventh wealthiest people in, in the U.S. at the time. Um, and then it turned out they, Backed out uh, the night before, and then you found out maybe about six months later that it had nothing to do with you. They got a divorce. Um, can you share who those you know, who those people are by any chance, or do you want to keep them private? Nope. Um, I, will say, I will say they approached me. They yeah. flew me out to California. They were interested in what we're going to do, and they offered carte blanche to take this to translational research. Um, it would have been a nonprofit, and we would have set it up in California. And um, it was it was an interesting time. Now, the disadvantage of that was we didn't have the techniques in those days that we have now. So we would have been relatively limited in what we could have done, but we could have taken it to translational work. For example, osteoarthritis, we could have done. Um, we probably could have done a heart disease. Alzheimer's, we couldn't have handled in those days. Now we can handle all of them, technically. Um, but yes, uh, I, I got a call from their lawyer. Um, they reneged on the whole deal. Uh, paid me a fair amount of money not to just accept it, uh, not to sue them, for example. Um, 
but left me wondering why. And it was at least six months, maybe a year later, that I understood from a, a, a mutual acquaintance um, that uh, they had gotten involved in a messy divorce. My understanding was that he thought she wanted it. She thought he wanted it. So they were damned if we're going to let the other one do what they wanted. So I got cut out. The way it was, wasn't the happiest day of my life. But as I say, we couldn't have done as much those days as we could have done now. Yeah, it's very unfortunate when you think about what could have come from there. And it just shows, I, I want to use this as another quick little inspirational thing for viewers, listeners, whoever's watching. We're really close. And the, the science is, is there, um, at least the data. And we just need to actually get the funding to actually run these studies. Have Dr. Michael West and his team at Telesite actually find out, you know, are these... Michael West is not a telesite. <laughs> I, I misspoke. I'm interviewing Michael Fossil. I apologize. Um, Michael Fossil and his team, you know, find out um, whether or not, you know, these gene therapies are actually going to reverse Alzheimer's and then, you know, other, other degenerative diseases as well, too. So just a little inspiration for people there who've been close before. And it could only, could just be that one person we could get to that has big pockets to invest in telesite. So, um, Sticking on the people, Elizabeth Blackburn. I mentioned her earlier. Um, just general thoughts on. Um, Elizabeth Blackburn has done, uh, again, some remarkable science. But uh, let me, um, without meaning in any way to denigrate Liz or what she's done, let me uh, give you an analogy. Let's go back to 1954. Let's posit two scientists. One is Jonas Salk, who invents the polio vaccine. And let's imagine that there's someone else there who's done the x-ray crystallography, if they could have done it, on the polio virus. And they have carefully described the polio virus in every possible detail, down to the electron shell. Okay? Um, but none of that had any clinical bearing. It didn't develop a vaccine. Nor, for that matter, could Salk describe the polio virus. He just knew how to cure it. He didn't, couldn't describe the electron shells by any means. Which one deserves the Nobel Prize? Which one, let me put it differently, that's not fair. Which one is more important to people? And I would say Jonas Salk. Never mind prizes aside, which one is more important to people? I'd say Jonas Salk is. Um, and I think what Liz Blackburn has done is remarkable science. She's done it in a very detailed way, and she deserves enormous credit for it. But by itself, that doesn't cure disease or make somebody's life better. Well stated, and I think that it's a really good point to, to bring up. I'll, I'll just speak for myself. I'm focused on curing human aging or age-related diseases and or I'm curious and focused on helping people. Compassion. I want to bring it back to that word compassion that you've mentioned so many times in your book and in interviews. That's what I'm focused on. I believe that's what you're focused on. And I want to encourage the viewers to think about that when they're in anti-aging, talking about this with their friends, family, uh, investing. Let's focus on the things that are actually going to get the most bang for the buck and that are going to help people as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, I mentioned Dr. Alyssa Apple. Were you aware of her? Do you know her? Personally, I don't think so. Okay. Were no, you I'm Were you surprised? To, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Were you surprised to hear what she said there about the, the skin cancer? And I don't, just real quick before you answer, I don't want to put her on the spot. I just haven't seen the data. You know, I watch YouTube videos and I see interviews and I see people mention this. And it's almost like they gloss over it. Oh, yeah, and long telomeres can cause melanoma and skin cancer. And then they go on to the next thing. I'm like, whoa, where's that data? Like, I want to see that. No, and I, I've looked at a lot of that data. And as I say, a lot of it just plain is misinterpreted. It, it's Cases where the logic is not well thought out, or the techniques are wrong, um, or they're interpreting some narrow part of it to imply something bigger. As I showed in that graph, they're looking at a narrow piece of it, not asking themselves what's really going on. So I understand it, but it's just not borne out by a broader look at the data, let alone um, an understanding of how those cells work. Okay, great. Uh, um, let me, okay, let me give you one more analogy, maybe carefully, but. We're on a, a desert island, and we are, we'd like to get off the island because water's rising, maybe. But we'd like to get off the island, and we stumble onto something, an interesting uh, something we find on the beach. 
actually on a big flat part next to the beach. And um, Liz Blackburn is the person who carefully measures it and can tell you exactly how it's constructed. Apple is the one who points out that it looks like there's some places on the inside that we could get healthier by getting in out of the sun and staying out of the rain inside, which is true. Uh, so she's offering some, some health advice based on telomeres, for example. Um, and I'm the one who says, you know, this is a plane. We can fly it off the island. Um, and, and, you know, so I appreciate the thoughts about how we can use the plane to stay healthier on the island. And I appreciate the fact that we know exactly how the paint plane is put together. But I would rather get in and fly it off the island. I would too. Let's get off that island back to civilization. Um, brilliantly stated. Uh, Cal Harley. I like Cal. I always have. Um, he's another guy who, you know, I had to deal with him 20 years ago. He's the one who gets the Nobel Prize, please. Um, I'll never forget the time Cal turned to me 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and said if he had a telomerase activator or, or telomerase therapy on his desk, would I take it? And I said, hell no. I'll let you take it for a couple of years and see how you do, and then I'll think about it. Um, because, you know, I'm not crazy, neither is he. We want this done. We want this to be effective, and we want it done safely. And that's always been Cal's take on this, too. Um, Cal uh, deserved, uh, in some sense, um, let me, let's just say better luck with regard to Jaron. Again, not naming names or pointing fingers, but um, Jaron um, could have been a much bigger success than it was, and Cal deserved that success. Got it. Very well stated. And, and I agree too. I had some, I had a few, tying it all into like me getting, I'm not famous, but like in the anti Asian world, some people reach out to you and a lot of people are, I've had one gentleman say, well, why don't you get the telomerase gene therapy or if you think, believe in it so much? I'm like, well, first of all, I'm kind of just reporting on this and learning. Uh, I have a communications degree, I'm not a PhD neurobiology and I'm not an MD. I'm kind of just trying to learn, share this information with the world. It's very expensive. Uh, I wouldn't even do it right now even if it was free because I'm 34, I'm healthy and I don't know there could be side effects. Um, I'm just trying to say let's continue to invest in this and let's uh, see if we can find out more data by getting this in people who actually want to do it and have a big need to do it. People who already have horrible diseases and don't have any other route from the traditional, uh, from any other therapies right now. Um, okay, that is the last few of the people that I have on here. And I wanna respect your time, uh, Michael. How, do you have a little bit more time? Because I have a few more fun ideas that we can get into. Go ahead. Okay, so I have honesty and compassion on here and I'm not gonna just go over it. I'm, I'm going to mention it one more time because I want to hammer it home to the audience. It's very, very important. Uh, you want to be careful who you follow on the internet and in this world. Michael is somebody who you really want to follow because of his long-term vision, view, uh, and experience in this field. So he's very honest. He'll tell it like it is. And he is focusing on compassion. So I just want to mention that one more time. From reading it. Let me let me give you a, a piece of something about honesty too. Um, I used to think of this as radical honesty. Uh, you know, in, in clinical settings, the resident, for example, would see a, a small shadow behind the heart, and they panic and they say, "How am I going to tell the patient they've got cancer?" And I said, "That's not being honest. Being honest is telling them, but being honest is telling them what you don't know too. The fact is, you don't know they've got cancer. What you know is they've got a shadow, and it makes you personally nervous, as it should, but you don't know what they've got." Be honest about it. Don't jump to conclusions. Tell them what you don't know. And let me give you an example of that. 24 years ago, did I, I, I tell you about the NIH talk I gave? Yes. Yeah, it, it, you know, it's that kind of thing. You know, when I walked in and I said, listen, anybody who leaves here is an idiot if you think you can reverse aging, and it was an idiot if you think you can't. The honest truth is you should walk out of here not being sure and saying, where's the data? That's being honest. And I see this so often as a problem in the anti-aging and longevity community. Somebody will say, this causes this, this cures that, this doesn't work. And the fact is, you don't know. Say that. I don't know. I know I think we can cure Alzheimer's. I don't know. I think we can. We'll see. 
intellectual honesty. That's what we that's what we need so much in this world, and specifically in this topic of you know reversing human aging. Um, I'll say real briefly. I told you I was a communications major. My uh, senior year of college, I had a health communications course, and my professor co-authored a book on health communications. And one exercise that we did multiple times throughout that semester was. Um, my professor would read a diagnosis that a medical doctor had really given to patients. So this were real things, not hypothetical. And they could have worded their language much more carefully is what I'll state. And then our exercise was to think about, hey, if you were the medical professional giving this information, how could you have changed your language a bit to have dramatic impacts on that individual? And so that was an important exercise that's really stuck with me when you're thinking about dealing with, with people's lives, you know, and communicating health advice. So any comments on that or we can move on? I just wanted to share that. I thought it was important. I remember one time there was a middle-aged patient I had who had gone through the ringer medically, came in to see me in the hospital. And I went out to see the family and they said, is he going to make it? because nobody thought he was. And I said, I gotta tell you, I can count up seven separate reasons why he should be dead right this moment, and he's not. So when you ask me if he's gonna be alive tomorrow, I give up, I have no idea anymore. Um, it's, you know, the, it, I used to joke that the only people are, who actually can tell you you've got six months to live are the TV doctors. Real doctors, if they have any brains, but the answer is, I can tell you what I've seen before, I can tell you what my guess is, but I don't know. That's the truth. So it's not easy, but um, I think most people appreciate it if you can actually be honest. And honesty, like compassion, is not one of those things that's trainable. You can probably train anybody to be a rocket scientist or a brain surgeon. You cannot train people to be honest and compassionate. I love it. Uh, thanks for those words. Um, okay, so moving on. Have you read Sapiens? Yes. Okay. I read your book again, Islam Ray's Revolution, uh, last week, and from reading it, I thought that you had probably read Sapiens because of talking about language and how humans uh, communicate, um, and, and that's really what separates us from other people. So I have all my books back here. I do book reviews on my YouTube channel. That's a book review that I want to do, and just for the general audience, I think that it's a, it's a good book. What, what did you think about the book in general? I'm trying to remember, I mean, to be honest, I'm trying to remember whether it's the one I'm thinking of or not. Um, I, I, remind me of which book this is, because I can think of two, uh, two possible ones, and I'm trying to remember which is which. Sorry, it's my old brain. So the book was originally written in 2011, but in Hebrew, because the author... That's, that's what I thought. Good. All right. The reason I like that is because of what he talked about is the conceptual revolution, um, because it bears on, on that remark about me and the gorilla. Um, one of the points he made was that his, his thought was that there was a conceptual revolution, which he thought was 70,000 years ago, 80,000 years ago. I remember when. When we went from the ability to talk about things in front of us to the ability to talk about things that don't exist. And he gave examples. For example, he pointed out you cannot kill General Motors. You can't go to General Motors. You can't stab General Motors with a knife. You can't shoot it and kill it. You can get a lawsuit and kill General Motors. That is, you can take something that doesn't exist, you can't touch, you can't eat, you can't stab. You can take something that doesn't exist, a lawsuit, and kill something that doesn't exist, General Motors. It's a conceptual device we have in talking about this great thing. There is no single place where General Motors exists. There are, there are factories, there are companies, there are offices, but there is no single place that General Motors exists. There it is, I can point right at it. Nor can you kill it with anything you can do, nor can you feed it. I mean, it doesn't exist in some ways, and yet it's very real for us. Um, and he, he made that same point. You know, if I talk about Tuesday, freedom, um, any number of concepts, they don't exist. There's no freedom I can grab and eat between a piece of bread. I can't. And yet it's very real. Most of what we deal with day to day doesn't exist. Most of what you and I talked about doesn't exist. Some of it does, but not a lot. You know, my nose exists. I can touch it. But I cannot touch compassion. And yet... It's not only an integral part of our lives, it's a critical part, far more than my nose is in those ways. It's busy getting red, I see on the camera. Um, but, you know, these things are critical to us. And it reminded me of something that I ran into when I was dealing with the gorilla, Coco, because I was her babysitter for a year. Um, 
Coco had a, had a bigger sign language vocabulary than I did. But as I think back about the vocabulary she had, none of it were things that weren't real. Um, I remember telling her one day there was a crocodile in her cage, and she got mad at me for it. But, uh, you know, the concept of revenge, the concept of joke wasn't there. She felt those ways, but, uh, you know, that wasn't in her vocabulary. Her vocabulary was very tangible. And that's one of the things I got a huge kick out of out of that book about sapiens. He was making a point that hit home to me because I see this in kids as they grow up too. You know, I look at a one-year-old versus a five-year-old, there's an enormous difference in the vocabulary. I don't just mean the number of words. I mean, they're beginning to talk about things that don't exist, but are very much part of our in life. Yeah, I noticed that from the book as well. And I think that's why a lot of people enjoyed the book. Yeah. So. It's, it's very interesting, and I think that those are the things that make us human, those things that are not real, but they're ideas that we all share. And so I want everybody to focus on those things because that's what makes us human, and compassion is one of those things. Well, it also allows us to do things we couldn't do before. They, for, they form bridges. You've got something tangible over here and something tangible over here, and the only way to between them is by something that's intangible. For example, smallpox helped. Cured sure, smallpox. The only way to get from here to here is to understand microbial theory, immunization, things that don't exist, but they allow you to bridge from something horrible to something better. They allow us to go from I'm starving, my crops won't grow, to I found a way to fertilize the water and irrigate, and now I can. In between those are these intangible things. They are tools, they're conceptual tools that allow us, frankly, to do the impossible. Well stated. So everybody read Sapiens. If you're not a big reader, I'll do a book review on it sometime. So, so check the YouTube channel for that. Um, since you went back to Coco from the introduction that I had for you, I wanted to give you an opportunity to maybe expand on some of those because they're such great stories. Um, <clears throat> so Buddhist monasteries, three continents, anything you want to share? Yeah, the story from my first book I mentioned, although I didn't tell a whole story. Um, they, they were, I was at a Tibetan monastery, and there were three Thai students there, two Thai students. And they came to me, and they said, you're a Westerner. I said, so. They said, you must know something about Western religion. I said, not very much. And they said, there are three minor sects that they'd like to know about because they can't tell the difference between these three minor sects. Would I help them? And inside, I'm panicking. I'm thinking, the difference between Methodists and Baptists, I have no idea. You know, how am I going to? I don't know. And I said to them, I said, listen. I'll tell you what I can, but I have to tell you, there's a lot of things I don't know, and I'm not going to be able to help you. I said, what are the three sects you've heard of? And they said, there's three minor sects that are called uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And I thought, now that's a different perspective. Um, you know, it's not the way that most of Europe and, and U.S. tends to look at those things. They tend to think of them as very widely different religions. But from their perspective, as good Thai Buddhists, realize how difficult it was to explain the differences when the differences were big to us, but the, the similarities were remarkable as well. Because as I say, holy book, single God, commandments, prophets, it's just much the same, different names for different parts of those, but much the same from their perspective. And I could see they were getting confused by it. So to be polite, I turned to them and said, well, now tell me a little bit about Buddhism. And they got this funny look on their faces and they said, you mean our Buddhism, the true Buddhism, or those heathen sects they practice everywhere else in, Egypt, in Asia. And I thought, we're not that different, are we? You know, um, we tend to look at it all as Buddhism, and they see the individual differences. They look at it all as Western religion. We see the differences. And nobody wants their son or daughter to marry someone who isn't whatever it is. We're all crazy. We're nuts. That's a powerful story, and I love it. And I just want to briefly mention, my wife and I, <clears throat> About a year and a half ago, I decided to quit our job, sell our home, travel the world. So we went to 25 countries last year across four continents. I had done some traveling uh, previously. My wife had traveled some too, but you learn so much from traveling. So a message of mine on my YouTube channel is getting people to become the best version of themselves by helping them break bad habits that are holding them back and form new healthy habits that will improve your life. And traveling is one of the best ways to get out there, see that. Your privilege probably is what you'll learn if you're watching this in, in the U.S. And also see that other people live other types of lives and there's benefits to some and there's downsides to others. It will make you appreciate certain things that you have and make you 
could be trying to improve upon some things that they're doing better in other places in the world. I remember dealing with some consultants who had gone over to work in Paris. And I found two sort of responses. One group of Americans dealing with the Paris people would say, a lazy so-and-sos. They get up, they get to the office at 10 o'clock, they take two hours off for lunch, they leave early, they drink all this wine, they don't work. And the other group would say, those Paris people know how to live right. They're not stressed. They don't, you know, worry about the little things. They get the important, and they're both right. It's just a different approach. It's not good or bad, but it's definitely different from yours. And you can look at it as good or bad. And as I say, half the group thought it was good and half the group thought it was bad. And they're both right. <laughs> you switched up the background. I love it. I just did a minute ago. It's time to switch. Okay. Or maybe I can do this. And, you know, talk about telling us that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So if it's okay with you, I'd love to hit upon the CIA agent um, rejuvenation reach. Just a few of those things that let your interest in other languages, and then we can go into telesite if that works. Sure. Um, the CIA agent was an odd story. It was uh, in Denver General Hospital, and a drunken man came in. It was one of the most offensive people we'd seen in six or eight months. He was remarkably unpleasant and 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 hostile. And the police had brought him in because they'd found him drunk in the gutter, but they didn't know who he was. There was no ID on him. His clothes had no tags. And he ended up, uh, I ended up having to restrain him. And he was spitting at all the nurses, so we ended up having to put a, a face mask across him. And then I ended up giving him hellball to put him down. And the last thing he said before he went out was, I'm a CIA agent, I'm going to kill you. And that's nice. Sure you are. Um, but we had a new nurse who I thought was naive. Um, and she said, I'm going to call the CIA and find out. I said, go ahead. She did. And they sent down two very nice people, um, black suits, uh, little bulges in the left, um, badges, uh, ID. Couldn't have been more polite. They introduced themselves. Yes, I'm CIA. Yes, he's one of ours. And I said, what is he doing domestically drunk in a gutter in Denver? And they looked at me. I said, I'm not supposed to ask, am I? I think, but I said, I'm really sorry, but it's going to be hours before he's capable of walking and getting out of here. They said, no problem. Let us know we're done. And they took him away. I never did find out. But he threatened to kill me. And you said this was in Denver? Yeah, it was in Denver about 1984, 1983, somewhere there. Now, what were you doing in Denver at the time? I was uh, working in Denver General Hospital in the ER. Um, a remarkable place to work. They called it the Knife and Gun Club. It was uh, an interesting education. <clears throat> okay, so was this right, because I thought in 1984 you started working at Michigan State. So this is right before then? Correct, right before that. Gotcha. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, it was, my wife and I had lived in a lot of places, and I said to her, listen, I'll move anywhere in the world you want. There are about four or five big cities I don't want to live in. I wouldn't mind practicing in. I don't actually live in them. I said, where would you like to be? And she said, Grand Rapids. And I said, where's that? So we ended up here. <laughs> and here we are almost 40 years later. Uh, and so I thought I heard you say in one of your other interviews that you found out after your parents' death that they were both potentially CIA agents as well, but you don't know. Well, I knew my father had been OSS. He used to be the, the exec, executive officer for Wild Bill Donovan who ran the OSS. And there were a lot of interesting stories about that. Um, and uh, when he died, it's something connected with CIA. But when he died in 1954, uh, it was my mother that raised us, single mother, five kids. And well, a lot of times that she'd be gone off to Europe. She worked for a company in New York. I thought, all, all mothers are single mothers who are executives in ad agencies. This ad agency turned out to be, a, in retrospect, a known front for the CIA. And it wasn't until decades later, in fact, years after my mother died, that we ran into, there are a couple of uh, ex-covert agents that I had met. Um, and one of them laughed hysterically. He said, you know, your parents are both CIA, to which our response was, no, my father was, but he said, and your mother too. And we went, no, she wasn't. I said, she never, she never told you, did she? He said, he said, you know, she shouldn't have either. Right, good. So I assume he was telling the truth. I will never know. I know she worked for an agency that, again, in retrospect, was known to be. Um, I know that she spoke a couple of languages. She and I lived in London for a little while. I'll never forget the time 
she took off down to Yugoslavia. And this was when it was still a communist country. Didn't bother her one bit. She went hiking in Yugoslavia at age 65 or something. And not as far as I know, not speaking a word of civil operation. She had a ball. No, she was a character. So it doesn't surprise me, but I will never know. Ah, so fascinating. Life is uh, crazy sometimes. That, that with the languages kind of ties into uh, the next thing that I introduce you with. Uh, you know, all the different languages that you really speak or dabble in. Sounds like that fascination was maybe cultivated by your mother and, and respect for traveling in other cultures? It may be. I've always um, found languages uh, sort of easy, easy in, easy out. Um, you know, I think I started off with English, which was handy, um, then Latin, then French, and some Arabic, uh, and then on to other things because they fascinated me. There's some languages, you know, I, I, German has never made sense to me. My son speaks better Russian than I will ever, ever. Uh, he does better in Cantonese. I can do better in Mandarin. Um, it just, you know, some things fit in my brain, some don't. I love Japanese, love the language. I've forgotten all my Vietnamese. Um, Spanish made sense. I've probably forgotten most of that. So, although there are all sorts of funny stories as well, but. Maybe for another time. Mm -hmm. um, and then founding editor of Rejuvenation Research. Uh, anything you want to plug or kind of share about that? Well, it started off as the Journal of Anti-Aging Anti -Aging Medicine. I guess it was Anti-Aging Medicine. It wasn't the title that any of us were happy with um, because, it, 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 again, there were some credibility issues with the titling of that. Um, and I, we finally convinced the publisher to change the name. And at about the same time, I found that I just had other interests and was too busy. So I ended up giving it to Aubrey de Grey. Um, and he's had it since that time. Yeah, okay. And that's, I, I got a little sidetracked. I wanted to mention, um, so Michael West is now the, I believe, CEO, uh, founder of Ajax, and Aubrey Gray is the CSO. Uh, do you want to share anything about your knowledge of what Ajax is doing? And Because I know they're working on telomeres and telomerase to a certain extent. Yeah. Um. Not really, except just a general comment. I, I would argue that they're still working sort of downstream from the most effective point of intervention. And um, leave it at that. Okay, that's, that's fair. And I, uh, it makes perfect sense. You're, you're doing what you're doing at Telesite because this is what you believe in the most. And I'm being honest, I'll, I'll tell this to, I told it to Aubrey Gray sitting next to him in my interview in July. People can see that. And I'll tell Michael West this and Dr. Greg Fahey, other people. I honestly believe I'm sitting here, you know, virtually talking to somebody who has, in my opinion, figured this out more than anybody else about why we age and how to intervene in it. And so I'm being very honest and open with that. Yeah, and if anybody's really curious, they could take a look at that upcoming paper. It's it's a it's a it's not an easy paper. It's seventeen thousand words. It's got three major parts. It's got two hundred sixty nine references and eight figures in it. Some of the figures actually I used just recently on this on this interview. Um, and it's got an epilogue that the editors write, asked me to write too. They're excited about it. They think it'll change the change the field when we're dealing with Alzheimer's and dementia research. But the exact same arguments I made there are generic age-related diseases, and I even say it in the summary, we're not going to stop with just the dementias, age-related dementias. We're going to move on to other age-related diseases. Love it. Um, okay, the final, the final point of uh, where I introduce you is your wife. You proposed to her after, you know, working with her for seven days and meeting her in a hypnosis lab. Uh, any other details on that? Because that's... We've never been sure who hypnotized who. Um, I was actually in a psych graduate program at, at Stanford before I moved to neurobiology. Um, and she was there because theoretically she couldn't be hypnotized, although it got us through the first 10 or 12 hours of her first delivery just fine. So, so much for not being hypnotizable works well. Um, and I, had, I probably still have the biggest hypnosis library of anybody in the state. Um, it was an interest of mine decades ago. Um, but that's where we ran into each other. We met each other, and then seven days later, I asked her to marry me. She said yes. I said, I'm serious. She said, yes, I am too. Our parents were not eager <clears throat> to see us married when we'd only known each other a week or so. Um, so they suggested we wait. We did not. We eloped. 
off the Carmel of all places without reservations, which was not the brightest thing, particularly since it turned out to be the weekend of the Monterey Jazz Festival, but there it was. <laughs> and then about nine months later, we got married co a second time. Uh, and although her parents never knew that we'd been married the first time, they're both dead now. She never wanted them to know that we'd eloped. She told me I could tell my mother. So the night before we got married the second time, I told my mother we'd eloped. And she said to me, this ex-CI agent, she said, that's the second smartest thing you have done in your entire life. And I said, and the first would be what? She said, choosing that woman, good choice. <laughs> so that, that was my question before you gave the punchline. The second smartest thing was telling her, right? Telling your mother? No, she said the second smartest thing was eloping. Oh, okay. Was, yeah, and the first smartest was choosing that particular woman to elope with. She respected her enormously, which is not always true of, you know, in-laws and daughter-in-laws and mother-in-laws, but no, they just... Definitely. I thought was an interesting character. You, I always knew if she didn't like somebody I was dating because she'd be exceedingly polite and the date would never know. The date would invariably say things like, your mother is just so nice. I think, oh, you're in deep trouble. <laughs> my mother, if my mother really liked you, she'd be teasing you, wrestling on the floor, making you do the dishes. No. no. If she was very polite, and she was, I don't mean playing with what, I mean just very nice, it was the kiss of death. Interesting. All right. Well, hopefully I'm being nice with you right now, and uh, I do like <laughs> uh, So I heard this in another one of your interviews a while ago. Secret staircases and one-way mirror in your house. What's the deal with that? Two secret staircases, a one-way mirror, a hidden room. Um, and I, I had a rat lab in the basement. I used to have a full-scale maze. I'd take bets people couldn't get through the maze um, that I'd built in the basement. A lot of odd things. The secret staircase is kind of interesting. It's not a secret, isn't it? Hidden is right. The secret it isn't. Oh, we wouldn't be telling you this. Um, but yes, uh, you actually have to push the DVD. Not that anyone uses DVDs as much anymore, but you have to push the DVD. The DVD is carefully labeled the secret door. And if you push that, it opens the secret door. Fascinating. Um, okay, so we had a little fun there. Let's move back to kind of, you know, anti-aging, important age reversal type things. I want to try and talk about the economies of scale here and, and, and how different respected people in this field have different opinions on this. And, and I want to also state that I believe that my opinion is in great accordance with yours. I want to just state that up front before we go in here. That just so, means we're both wrong, Brent. Just, you know. <laughs> there is possible. Okay. Uh, if, if you've been, if the viewers have been paying attention during this interview, you then, then they'll know that we very well could be both wrong, but I don't think so. So when I interviewed Bill Andrews in May 30th of this year at his lab, I was very shocked to hear that not only did he believe that telomerase gene therapy costs will not be coming down anytime soon, but he actually believes that they will be going up. At least this is what he said. If you find it on my YouTube channel, May 30th this year. Um, you believe very differently as I do that the costs you know, will come down like many technologies, biotech and, and non-biotech come down as they scale. You mentioned this a little bit in your book that I'll say one final thing real quick, Michael, and then I'll, and I'll let you go off. But in the telomerase revolution book, you mentioned that basically if you remove, uh, this is kind of my language. I'm just kind of remembering what you state. If you kind of remove all the bureaucracy stuff from what telomerase gene therapy will eventually be removed, the cost of the hospital, the insurance, the high paid person who's injecting you, I think we can get it down to about a hundred dollars um, and that's what I was kind of thinking where this will scale to share share your thoughts about the economics of where this should and hopefully will lead to well it's complicated as you might guess right um, here's one part of it. Um, right now I can get it made probably within an hour of my house by a grad student who could do it for very little um, but the safety and the efficacy would be horrible uh, even a professional run of these things typically uh, 25 percent is good 75 percent you actually have to throw out um, and you can imagine what happens on a college campus if I'm doing this as you were saying in the garage it, it's this is not easy this is tough science um, now the other part that plays into this before I really get into the cost of it is that right now it's a seller's market um, there's so many you know I look at the FDA statistics two days ago on the the growth of gene therapy applications at the FDA and they're going up year by year and a lot of that work uh, is using the same viral vectors. And so the people who are selling the viral vectors 
of putting them together professionally and carefully and, and you know, making sure it's done carefully um, are not only expanding, but they're finding they cannot keep up with the demand from academic labs, biotech companies, pharmaceutical global firms. They can't keep up with it. So they can essentially charge a lot. Um, and it already is expensive to do it right. And even though there are more and more companies going into this with various degrees of credibility and, and safety, um, it's still a sort of a seller's market. So the expense of it initially is high, and a fair amount of that, most of it, frankly, is um, the actual actual cost of creating these things. And the, the costs are, a lot of that cost is just the setup cost. Let me give you an example. If I want to right now, today I had to go out and buy a, a new iPhone for my daughter because her old one died. And let's say, I, I'm going to make this number up because I don't even want to know. Let's say that an that it, that uh, an iPhone right now, let's say that it costs a thousand dollars. Say it does. We would think of that as very expensive. But if you wanted to produce your first iPhone and there was no prior iPhone, it would cost a lot more because the expense, expense is not just making it, it's gearing up, setting up the factories, hiring the people, finding the right people, doing the research, and that's expensive, enormously expensive. The same thing is really true with regard to gene therapy. The expense is not the production. The expense is getting the whole thing set up in the first place exactly right. So it is safe, effective, trustworthy. You know, that's expensive. Um, so as an example, I was looking at the stats for us. Um, and as I say, if I've got 12 patients I'm treating, it may run me about $4 million to set up a first run for those. But that first run also produces enough to treat about 100 patients. So it almost doesn't matter whether I'm treating 12 patients or 100 patients. Um, or likewise, I could treat 100 dogs. You know, it's a lot of things I can do. Um, and after that, the expenses, there's a certain baseline expense, but you've already gone over that big hump of expense and getting things set up to be safe, trustworthy. Um, and then, you, uh, you know, typically you're looking at at least a 40% law of drop in cost. And then you're looking at increased technology. And already, if I look, go back over the past few years and look at the cost of putting together some of these gene therapies, um, the actual production cost has fallen as we've gotten better and better at doing it. The cost per patient, for example, of doing this stuff. I expect that'll continue as well. The other big deal though is this. Um, almost all the other drug companies who are doing this sort of work with gene therapy are going after rare diseases, orphan disease. For example, a friend of mine uh, is the guy who put together the gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy, SMA. Um, and there are not a lot of SMA patients in the United States in any given year. There are a lot more than I wish there were, but there are many. You know, and so if I, if, let me give you an extreme example. Say I'm looking at progeric kids. These are kids who at age five look like they're 70 years old, but I used to get together all over the world once a year. And, you know, uh, typically we knew about three to four dozen kids in the world with progeria. Now there were probably more, but those are the ones we could track down and knew about in any given year, three or four dozen of them. And you can imagine the costs if I had to, to spend $4 million to treat four dozen kids, that's a lot of money. On the other hand, if you're dealing with Alzheimer's disease or cardiovascular disease, you know, almost everybody is listening to this. If nothing else happens, you're most likely to die of cardiovascular disease. Second most likely to die of CNS related dementias and so forth. Um, and then there are things like cancers and so on. But these are not orphan diseases. These are universal global diseases that everybody gets if you live long enough. If you don't get shot, stabbed, automobile accident, or die of infection when you're young, you will get age-related diseases. These are universal. So we're not looking at, in any respect, an orphan disease or a rare disease. So when we go to a, a, a pharmaceutical group or a, a, a vendor who's producing gene therapies for us on contract, we're not saying to them, we're looking for something where we'd like to treat 3,000 patients a year worldwide. We're saying we'd like to treat 3 billion patients in the next couple of years. And the economy of scale is just enormous. Plus, it gives them an opportunity to move ahead with things with a much more stable market. So we're talking about making deals with potential vendors and saying, come in with us. We will guarantee that what we're going to do is going to be a lot easier and cheaper for patients. You know, even at its, at its upper limit cost, again, napkin calculation, I'm looking at $10,000 for one-time treatment to prevent or cure Alzheimer's disease compared to $100,000 a year that doesn't help you. Um, 
our best estimates is you'll probably need a, a retreatment in between five and 10 years to sort of reset things. Um, but still, you know, we can probably get that price down too. We are not dealing with a $3 million one-time treatment. We are dealing with the kind of money that is a lot cheaper than buying a car. That's still expensive. On the other hand, it's having Alzheimer's too. It sure does be having Alzheimer's. Um, very, very well stated. I appreciate you sharing all those details because it's in incredibly important. Um, pivoting real quick. So one thing my wife and I did. That, that even though that's truly expense, you know, we can do this cheaply. There's also enough money to be made that investors um, will get, you know, an investor, nobody's going to put money in a company to lose it. I, I wouldn't either. You wouldn't put your pension in it either. You know, none of us would. We think that we can also make sure that the people who invest in this are going to make money. They should. They're welcome to. It's not why I'm in it, but they should make money or they wouldn't do it. Good for them. Having said that, we intend to cure disease and make lives better. Period. I love it. And I want to tell a real quick story. It's about a year ago, almost exactly, I was listening to Dr. Peter Atia. Are you familiar with him by any chance? I don't think so. He, Unless he, I've misheard the name. I don't think so. Yeah, Peter, P-E-T-E-R-A-T-T-I-A. -E -E uh, he runs an anti-aging practice in New York, and he's also uh, <clears throat> on YouTube and the internet and uh, anti-aging. Very well, good speaker, in my opinion. Quick story. At his practice um, a little over a year ago, he has a longtime patient of his who's in his 80s who is a longtime friend of Warren Buffett. He would, this patient of Dr. Peter Atiyah's would meet Warren Buffett about every six months for decades. And every six months, uh, Warren Buffett would tell his friend um, about a new investment. And Warren would be so excited about it. Well, what Peter shared, again, I heard this about a year ago, is that this gentleman says the past couple of years, whenever he meets Warren, he's not telling him about an investment. He's telling him about anti-aging therapies that Warren Buffett is privately researching and telling to his friends. So I only mention that because there's a guy who's got tons of money, who's in his late 80s, and who is researching this stuff according to this anecdotal one-off of one-off, one-off story here. But I believe that it's true. And so we just get to one person like that for an investment for Telesite. I mean, Warren Buffett makes and loses a billion dollars in his net worth almost every single day, depending, depending upon the share price in Berkshire Hathaway. So that would be more than enough investment to completely change, you know, Tilo Site's roadmap. It's funny you say that because that's actually how we got started. It was one person. Um, our CEO, Pete Rayson, Peter um, is in the UK. He spent his whole life working in the aerospace industry, uh, Rolls-Royce jet engines, for example, Airbus, for example, all over the world. And his mother had Alzheimer's. Um, and he uh, did as much research as he could to understand where the field was going and what could be done. And he called me and uh, we met in Boston. And he said to me, uh, you know, I re re reviewed and researched all of these other techniques and none of them make sense and none of them have worked. He said, you're the only one with a systems approach. And I said, what do you mean a systems approach? He said, well, let me explain it to you. When I'm dealing with a Rolls-Royce jet engine and one of the fan blades cracks, I don't ask, what's wrong with a fan blade? I ask, what's wrong with the whole engine that made the fan blade fail? It's a systems approach. It's not the specific fan blade. It's the whole darn thing working together. He said, you're the only one who's actually dealing with a systems approach. So, so we started Telesight. Um, <clears throat> But the point I'm making is that it just takes one person. And in this case, it was Peter Raisin. Very well stated. And I, I like that you mentioned the system approach because we haven't used that terminology yet uh, during this um, conversation. So I'm really glad that you brought that people up, that you brought that up. And I hope that people will use that terminology when communicating this, this message. Well, it's a problem. You know, most people, and again, I'm looking at, uh, for example, Eli Lilly's solanazumab drug or biogens, you know, anacanumab, they tend to focus on the fan blade. They say to themselves, it's beta amyloid. Well, all right, but why is it beta amyloid? Yes, it's the fan blade, but why did the fan blade fail? And that's what they miss. They haven't got a systems approach, which is, again, why a year ago, everybody approached me and said, yes, you're right, systems approach, you got it. Yeah, it's a systems approach. Until we look at it that way, you don't solve it.
It's a great point. And I'm not even saying what I'm about to say is true regarding beta amyloid or tau, but sometimes, you know, there's that story of somebody shows up to a house that's burning down and they see the firefighters putting out the fire and they mistake that the firefighters are the ones that cause the fire. It's like, you know, this is the end stage, like we're trying to fix things. So people can misinterpret all sorts of data and I just want to bring it all back to you know you and, and your work and just encouraging people to read your book and listen to more about what you're talking about because I, I think that this makes the most sense to me by far. So, um, Anything else you want to say on that before we pivot? Nope. Okay, so my wife and I, uh, in March of this year, we had bone marrow aspirations and we had our bone marrow cryogenically stored actually in Michigan by a company called uh, uh, Forever Labs. I have their little, they sent me this little um, water mug I'm drinking out of, but I, apparently our, our uh, bone marrow is being cryogenically stored in a separate company that they partner with in Indiana, but Forever Labs is headquartered in, in Michigan. Was that smart that we did that? I mean, you know, based off everything that you know, I mean, I just removed all that bone marrow I was told that my body would regenerate that and I'll probably be fine. And obviously the point is that I'll have all this in case we can use it to improve our health at some point, maybe decades down the road. But what do you think about stuff like that in general? I wouldn't do it. Okay. I, based off everything you said, it kind of makes sense and I don't know. Well, it, you know, if you're looking at it in terms of, um, I want a source of stem cells later, and I understand that. But in fact, you can just reset your stem cells. Um, there's, you know, it's like saying I'm going to take stem cells and replace the um, the, the the senescent uh, chondrocytes in your knee. You've got osteoarthritis, and we're going to give you some stem cells for your knee. We're putting in extra stem cells that we have changed from marrow cells that we extracted a decade ago, and you don't need to. You can just take the senescent cells and reset them in your knee. So I, you know. Gotcha. Yeah, and I, I knew all that stuff before I did it, but those technologies don't fully exist right now, if I'm not correct. Yeah. So yeah. That's what I was kind of making a bet. I'm like, oh, I'm getting older. My wife and I are both 34. This is kind of like an insurance policy, but we also just removed all that bone marrow there that could have been used to help us when we get older. Well, I love when you say you're getting older. I mean, you're half my age, actually, exactly, I mean, a little less. I know, but I'm telling you, I'm, I'm taking a really aggressive approach to this stuff because I just see more and more time ticking along, and I, I want to do whatever I can to speed this up. And so, um, yeah. So, um, sorry, looking at the notes real quick. Okay. Dave Asprey, your interview with him from a couple months ago, I thought was, or excuse me, from, from three years ago, I thought was great. And, but I want to, I want to keep you intellectually honest in the sense of, in the spirit of everything we've been talking about. You said that, uh, I believe that was about three years ago, that interview you said you think it's doable and you were referring to curing Alzheimer's within two years. You know. It's still doable, it's just a question of having the funding to do it. Totally, and, and I'm not, uh, what, I'm, what I'm stating is you said in that interview, it's doable within about two years. So I think you pretty much just answered that. It really just comes down to funding, right? This, that is what's really holding this up. That's it. Okay. Oh, there, there, there's an old concept in chemistry of the rate limiting step. And in any, in any chemical reaction, there's a rate limiting step. Not enough oxygen, not enough temperature, not enough, something that, that defines the slowest, slowest part. Um, usually it's, it's one of the reagents. But... The same thing is true here. There are three sort of rate limiting steps. One that you could look at would be the FDA. Not a real concern of ours. Um, you know, it takes time, it has to be done right, it has to be done carefully, but not really the rate limiting step. The second rate limiting step, oddly enough, is production. It typically, to get the volume and the safety we need, takes six or nine months from the time we sign the contract to the time we have the, the material we need to move ahead. The third rate limiting step, and it's proven to be the biggest one, is just getting that investment. I sometimes say that, you know, we've had a, a lot of little investors, including myself, um, I'm here. Uh, I sometimes say that you can't jump a chasm in two steps, two jumps. You either jump the chasm or you don't. You can't jump partway and then jump the rest of the way across a big chasm. And that's sort of where we are. 
you know, we can do little things. I, you know, I, I already talked to the FDA. We'll be going back to the FDA, but I can't sign contracts to make the gene therapy. I can't sign contracts um, for the site that we're going to do. I can't sign contracts for the animal toxicity uh, work. There are a lot of things I can't do until we have the funding to do it. So we either do or we don't. There's no halfway jump. Okay, makes perfect sense. And I thought that would be the answer, but I really appreciate you <clears throat> making that super clear and, and sharing details. Um, this leads into kind of my next question. Are you familiar with the Ch uh, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative? I don't think so. So this is one that's really interesting that I'm gonna look into a lot more. Um, so Chan Zuckerberg is Mark Zuckerberg. Yes, right. So, so Chan Zuckerberg Initiative was announced three or four years ago or so, people can look it up and find out, but it was about a year ago, and I believe it was early 2018, they announced that their, don't quote me on all this exact language, but basically their mission is that they want to uh, help scientists around the world, globally, cure aging and all age-related diseases. And I don't think they're using age-related. They're trying to cure all diseases by the end of the century. So we're at about 80 years from now. That is their either mission statement or it's a big goal of theirs. So I'm going to, you know, try a few things to try and get in touch with them. They have a lot of funding. Mark Zuckerberg has donated, I think, at least eight or maybe $11 billion of Facebook stock to this initiative. So this is real, it's happening. And um, I don't know, your general thoughts on this. Um, my general thoughts is that most of the money they're putting in on this, and I'm going to uh, show you an image of this, is involved in what I call perfecting outdated technology. <laughs> that ring a bell? And <laughs> here is that image, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What they're doing is they're trying to find the most effective way to add balloons to something rather than inventing anti gravity. They're dealing with last year's technology. So that's not going to get them very far. Um, I sometimes have said with regard to a lot of this research um, that the people I know in the Alzheimer's community and the people I know in the aging community and the bottle research um, are some of the brightest people I know. They are well-trained, well-educated, they have integrity, they work hard, um, and they are, and this is unfortunate, they are some of the best 20th century minds I know. They are still dealing with yesterday's technology. They're still focused on, for example, genetics, not epigenetics. They're still focused on precision medicine rather than asking themselves, how does the disease work in the first place? If, you know, if we were 200 years ago, a little more than that right now, uh, and we were doing bloodletting for George Washington, who died probably of a, of a strep infection, but um, we we're doing bloodletting on him, and we had precision medicine, we had uh, gene, gene therapy, and we had, um, well, let's see, quantum computing and massive data crunching and AI, and that's all we had. We would, again, have the, simply the, the best possible bloodletting, but that's not the point. The point is you've missed the conceptual revolution of saying you don't need bloodletting. You know, we would still be arguing about which, which vein to cut. And, and that's kind of what's been going on so much with the research. And so it almost doesn't matter how much money or resources, quantum, quantum mechanics and you know, quantum computing and AI, it's not a matter of how many resources you put in, it's a matter of where you put those resources. And if we continue to put resources into perfecting outdated technology, we're not gonna get anywhere. Right, very, very well stated and I completely agree with you which is actually the reason why I brought it up. It, the main point that I want the viewers to take home is that, hey, here you have this massive Chan Zuckerberg Institute, excuse me, initiative is what it's called, with billions and billions of dollars, and they're not focusing on the right things, in my opinion. I think I'm just that type of guy. I'm optimist. Let's get this information out to them so hopefully they change and they can invest in, in telecyte and and help move this science along. I'm just, I'm not gonna I'm give up and I'm gonna try some ways. And so I have sales experience and I have ways of reaching out on like LinkedIn um, to try and get in touch with some of these people and see if I can um, persuade them in any way to take a look at Telesite. So I'll just share that what I'm doing and I'll say to the viewers, if there's anything you guys have certain skills in or, or ideas to reach out to them, it could be something worth looking into. Buena suerte.
Roll chance. Good luck. Talk yeah. yeah. I'll let you know if we find anything. So, um, but, uh, okay. So, general health advice. We've gone over this kind of a little bit. You've touched upon it, but let's just right now. I mean, sleep is, I think, really important. That's something that um, I talk about all the time. I think sleep is the most important thing that you can do to improve your health right now. And without any other crazy biotech or any biotechnologies, and it's completely free, but most people don't know how to do it properly. And so I talk about that on my YouTube channel. And I just want to mention Dr. Matthew Walker's book, Why We Sleep. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. And I don't know, your thoughts. I think you and I probably talked about this before. Uh, I sometimes say, you know, if I think about my, my clinical career, I have sometimes said that um, the best advice you can get is probably what your grandmother told you. Your doctor told you the same thing. Your grandmother charged less, but you didn't follow either of them, their advice, uh, because it just wasn't sexy. The advice almost always is <clears throat> sleep right, exercise, eat a reasonable diet, be nice to people. I mean, it just it goes on and on. Um, it, you, you can throw in meditation. You can throw in anything you like to. People won't do it. Uh, you know, we had enough trouble over the last few decades getting people to, to quit smoking. Um, there's a lot of pretty good, pretty obvious advice that people don't take. Having said that, most of that advice doesn't actually change what's going on. In 1952, I think it was, there was a best-selling book in the U.S. called, I think it was called Diet Prevents Polio. I used to think it was Diet Conquers Polio, but I think it was Diet Prevents Polio. And the argument was that if you ate right, or if your children ate right, they wouldn't come down with polio and be crippled or die. And there was a certain amount of truth to that. I mean, a certain amount. Namely, if you eat right, you're probably, your body's got a little better immune system, a little likely, a little less likely to have a problem, but not by much. Faced with a choice between a perfect diet and a polio vaccine, I'd go for the polio vaccine and have an imperfect diet. Um, on the other hand, in 1952, what else was there? Nothing. Um, so in 1952, the advice about having a better diet and staying out of public swimming pools and a lot of other advice like that was well, not bad advice. It was all we had. And in many respects, that's where we are now. People talk about how can you, for example, prevent Alzheimer's. The answer is you can't. But if you're looking at little things again, um, diet, stress, uh, sleep, you name it, all of which remains relatively good advice. It's not sexy, but, and it's not all that effective, but what else is there? Um, yeah, good advice. Not because it's going to prevent Alzheimer's or prevent age-related diseases, but it's better than nothing. And people still don't do it, but it should. <laughs> well, I have personally, Joe Rogan, who I would love to get you on that, uh, on his podcast as well, only because he has so many viewers who are interested in reversing aging. Um, he had Matthew Walker on, and I believe it was May or so of 2018. And that was one of the podcasts that changed my life. I then started listening to all of, Dr. Matthew Walker's interviews and YouTube videos he was doing to promote his book. Uh, I've listened to maybe 10 or 15 of those over a few months. Then I read his book and then I started actually implementing those things in my life. And I've been interested in sleep for many years and I just couldn't find the right information for whatever reason. Uh, him and his other colleagues have figured out way more things than I realized. And it has dramatically helped me uh, because if you're doing diet and exercise, those are great, but sleep is shown to be more important than diet and exercise, like he's proven this in their labs, and it's probably more important than both of them. And so what I mean by that is you could be eating the perfect diet, and of course that doesn't exist, but you could also be exercising great, but if you're not getting the proper sleep, then you're not getting all those benefits. So in other words, sleep is the foundation of health. It has to come first for those other things to to get benefit out of those. Does that make sense? Well, it does. Uh, you know, we think about the effects that the that, that sleep has on brain function, for example, what's called lymphatic function. Um, but there are a lot of effects it has and probably a lot more that we're not aware of at all. Um, it plays a role. Um, and I think that you can make a reasonable argument, given the data, that um, if you sleep poorly, it can have a, an upstream effect on accelerating Alzheimer's disease. On the other hand, again, some of that's simply correlational. It may be that people who have early Alzheimer's don't sleep well, which is not surprising. So it's a little hard to tease out which is cause and which is effect, but still, 
I think it's reasonable to assume that if you can cause good sleep, you should. Yeah. Yeah, Dave Asprey, who interviewed you uh, uh, three years ago that I mentioned, he recently had uh, Dr. Matthew Walker on a couple months ago. And Dr. Matthew Walker shared that they in their lab now can see um, just by one night of not getting enough sleep, you have the uh, genetic, uh, you have certain genes turn on that, or excuse me, you have genes turn off, the longevity genes turn off. That took me a while to get that out. But basically, every single night you're not getting good sleep, it's turning off those longevity genes. And, and that speaks volumes to me. Well, I think you're right, although I would argue with the concept of longevity genes, just as I'd argue with the concept of Alzheimer's genes, there aren't really either. On the other hand, there are genes that play a role in both. They're just not one or the other, really. But it's that, that pattern of expression. Some genes expression goes up, some goes down. And in both cases, if you're not sleeping well, those tend to have bad outcomes. Definitely. Um, sticking into the or sticking on the concept of health overall, I've heard you mention a few times that gardening is what you do for exercise, and that kind of makes people uh, takes people off, catches people off guard a little bit. And I completely agree. I, I garden here all the time, and I do other exercises as well too that you might not uh, agree with, like basketball and dodgeball. That's probably putting a lot of stress on my my knees and certain things. But um, tell us a little bit about you know. <laughs> I love it. Go ahead. Yeah, that's my garden. That's part of it. I have a lot more to it. But yeah, I love gardening. I like having a, a beautiful area if I can make it that way. Yeah, it's super important. Um, one other thing. I'll, give you, I'll give you a short story of this. Um, most people, when they get their first job, go out and buy something, usually on credit card. They get a new car, they get a new computer, they get a new stereo system, they get a new something, new cell phone. They, they often We'll go out and buy something. It's a mark of, I have a job, now I have X, okay? I did too, but what I did was I went up my credit card and I bought $2,000 worth of daffodil bulbs. And 40 years later, they're still coming up. And somebody went out and bought a new car, it's long since in the junk heap. Likewise, that cell phone that didn't exist 40 years ago anyway. And likewise, their computer system, whatever. My daffodils are still around. That's what I bought. That is awesome. That is not what I thought you were going to say either. So very interesting. Um, sticking on the concept of health, microbiome. Uh, my wife and I also in March of this year, we did the Viome, V-I-O-M-E, microbiome test. And we've been eating the diet pretty closely. I, I'd say that I'm eating about 75% of the calories I intake are my foods that are recommended to me by the service. And I'll just state real quick, I don't believe that all the microbiome companies out there are equal. I personally believe biome is the best. With that being stated, I'm not com completely convinced that this science is very accurate right now. And I think that we're learning a lot. And hopefully by me purchasing this service and contributing my data to this, I'm helping in some little small way contribute to the microbiome science that's evolving. But what it appears to be is that it's the microbiome that is having other epigenetic effects on us um, from all these little critters. So, I mean, I know you've mentioned microbiome before. What's your current thoughts on this and how important it is for our health? Well, it's right in here someplace in one of my purple up, upstream parts. Now, there are a lot of things that play a role in the rate at which your cells age. Um, and microbiome is one of those things in a number of probably indirect ways. Um, so yes, it plays a role. It's not, uh, you know, it's like talking about sleep. It's like talking about diet as opposed to microbiome. It's like talking about avoiding head trauma. You know, I used to joke that the, the easiest way to extend your lifespan is to fasten your seatbelt. Yeah, it does. <clears throat> not make you younger, but it extends your lifespan. But, but there are a lot of factors up here. And microbiome is one of them. Diet's one of them. Uh, you know, avoiding ultraviolet radiation is one of them. Um, it's one of many factors. It's not an unimportant one. It's not the only one either. But it's part of the, the whole process that plays a role in uh, what happens to those cells and how fast they begin to go bad. Yeah, uh, great points. All I can say anecdotally is that, as I said, I've probably been about, to my best guess, 75% eating this diet for the last, uh, we'll call it, what, eight months or so. And 
in the interest of just being transparent, my number twos, my bowel movements have been a lot better. I just think that they're younger, um, like they kind of were when I was younger. They come out smoother, easier. Could that be, it's not placebo, because I know that this is an objective change in my health, but could it be microbiome or, you know, the biome test I did, could it be something else possible? But my best guess is I think it is helping my health. So just, just sharing it. I never in a million years thought I was going to get on this call and talk about your bowel movements. <laughs> and it's, it's gross. And I, whatever I thought about, maybe not even mentioning it, but I think it is important. And, uh, and I think that it has been helping. So that's the only reason I, I bring it up. No, you're probably right. I mean, we probably, most Americans don't need a diet that's very good. Um, and it, it has an effect on the microbiome. But as I say, you know, there, there are all these factors that you can affect. You can affect the diet, the microbiome, your exposure to ultraviolet radiation, your avoidance of head trauma, all of these things you can do, except for this first one, the chronologic age. And that is, you know, no matter what you do, no matter how careful you are about your environment or your, your infections here, you know, various infections you can get, or your, even if you could change your genes, your risk of genetic abnormalities, chronologic age is the biggest factor that plays a role in cell senescence and ultimately in disease. That's the one I can fix. I can change that. I can reset all of that. It doesn't make your, your diet any better if I, if I uh, reset your telomeres. It doesn't make your likelihood of infection any better. You change your genes, but it changes gene expression. That in itself, I can do something about. So I encourage everybody to do what they can about these other things. You know, avoid smoking, for example. Avoid ultraviolet radiation, for example. Avoid head trauma, for example. Improve your microbiome, for example. But, but ultimately, the main driver is age itself. It, no matter how careful you are, that'll get you unless we reset it. So we'll reset it. Great, very, very great. Um, one thing that I wanted to state earlier that I kind of forgot about was when we were talking about DNA methylation and telomere testing, the, basically the best way to measure somebody's biological age, Bill Andrews mentioned this to me, and, and I have always thought this is true, I think the best way is just look at somebody and you can tell we're pretty darn good at looking and being able to figure out how old people are. And when I say we, I mean people in general. So to me, that's the ultimate test. Um, and I want to see people who are old starting to get young. And I think that what you guys are doing is the best way for us to actually get there to accomplish that goal. Well, I think you're right. Um, you know, the people age at different rates and different parts of the body age at different rates. You'll have somebody who has relatively young skin, but they have bad joints. Somebody else has great joints, but they have heart disease. Somebody else has no heart disease, but their hair is gray. Um, you know, different body parts age at different rates. And um, aside from the cosmetic issues, you know, the, the wrinkles, um, aside from those issues, what I would like to know as a physician or somebody who's trying to make somebody's life better is what can I do to avoid the major age-related disease, particularly the ones going to kill them. As I say, most people, most people listening right now, if nothing else happens, they'll die of vascular aging, usually arterial aging. Um, so typically, it may be the coronary arteries. And in that case, if I really wanted to identify what was going to kill them, what I'd like to do is see the telomeres in the endothelial cells that line their coronary arteries. Well, technically, I could do that. It involves some messy biopsy, but it's doable. Um, I could do that. But... Um, but it's not easy. And as I say, it doesn't, um, doesn't make you younger, but it might make those particular cells younger if I could find out what's going on with them. And maybe we could do something to prevent that disease. But it's a generic problem. It's not just how people look, although that's, you're right, probably the best single estimator is how people look, how they act, how they walk, how they talk, how fast they talk. Um, those give you clues about people's health. You know, when we do the Alzheimer's trial, we'll be measuring a, a, a number of uh, biomarkers in the cerebral spinal fluid. We'll be measuring a lot of biomarkers in the blood. We'll be doing scanning studies, imaging studies. We'll be looking at biometric MRIs and targeted PET scans. But, you know, ultimately, the single most important factor is how well people think. And so it's the neuropsych exam that really matters. It's, in some sense, the gold standard for the patient and really for the physician, too. And to make this clear, Let's say that you could be one of two people. You can either be somebody who's completely incapable of thinking, caring for yourself, remembering anybody's name, feeding yourself, or anything else, 
but all your blood scanning, your biomarkers are entirely normal. I mean, your brain scanning, your biomarkers are entirely normal. Or you can have your physician tell you that your, your MRI series don't have a brain, your PET scan has absolute disaster, all your biomarkers are through the roof, but you're perfectly capable of thinking normally. And you don't know why they're telling you all this, but you think fine, you go to work fine, your wife thinks you're normal. Which would you rather be? I think the second one. I don't care what my doctor tells me about my brain scan. I care the fact that I can actually function. So ultimately, the gold standard is function in, in, in Alzheimer's. But it bears back to your point. It's not simply a matter of your telomeres. It's not a matter of your brain scan. It's not a matter of your biomarkers. It's a matter of how well you are as a human being. Very well stated. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned all those details because I wasn't aware of that regarding telocyte and, and the, the biomarker test that you guys uh, you know, plan to do. So um, well, that's fantastic. Um, transhumanism. What do you think about this term in general? And uh, do you consider yourself a transhumanist? Transhumanist is another one of those terms like exosome and nanomachines or nanobots to, or for that matter, quantum something or nano something else that it changes over time, and it depends what you mean. It always, it always reminds me of the question of, do you believe in God? And the answer is, what do you mean? What specifically do you, you know, are you envisioning a, some, some old male with white hair sitting with a scepter and orb and a throne? Or are you envisioning some, you know, something that started the universe back, you know, 12 billion years? What do you mean? Um, but the same thing is true of transhumanism. I've seen a lot of people give a lot of definitions and I sort of give up, uh, be specific, um, got me? Yeah, it, I was just kind of, we're being, we're having fun here, and my answer is generally the same as yours. Whenever people give me the do you believe in God answer, I, I tell them I'm agnostic, and that, that's not to be confused with agnostic, with his A-G in a, agnostic is I-G, and most people have never heard of that term, which basically means that first you have to define what God is, what you mean by God, and then we have to come to an accordance on that definition. And you'll find by doing that exercise is that almost nobody on the planet, there's no two people who have the exact same definition of God. Therefore, we can't even speak to each other properly. And pretty much, you know, what you so eloquently stated. So I, I think I there was a, a, somebody I know very well who was involved politically with a, a committee where people were on opposite sides of an important issue. And they were sort of name calling and very angry at each other. And he put down a ground rule. He said, we're not allowed to use any buzzwords, none. We will talk about specific facts and data, but we will not use current terms like you know, fascist, Nazi, socialism. No, so show me the dollar, show me the law, show me the, the name, what are you gonna do? And people discovered actually they were a lot closer together than they thought they were. As soon as they took away these terms, transhumanism. Well, it's like my, my point about exosome. If you take away the term exosome, take away the term and say, what are we actually doing? What are the results? Things are a little easier. And it was certainly true of this political committee who said they actually came to a consensus and nobody expected that when they stopped naming things and started dealing with facts. Oh, I love it. And the way that I feel like we can bring this all home to our whole conversation, the whole point of, of all of this is that there's all these people in the anti-aging field or longevity movement or whatever you want to call it, and they have all these different beliefs. But again, if you just look at the data, the single point of intervention is telomerase gene therapy. That's going to help the most and have the best ROI according to the data, you know, in, uh, in, in your opinion, I believe, in my opinion. So. Well, that's true, but most people don't look at the data. And as I say, people have a tendency to think magically. They honestly believe that resveratrol or NAD plus will be the answer. And they're just not looking at broader data. Okay, so you've been super um, helpful and this has been very, you've been very generous with your time. If you have just a few more minutes, a couple final points, then we'll hammer home. Is that okay with you? You better move along. I've lost my whole afternoon. I think <laughs> okay, so as I mentioned, my last job was at LinkedIn and we got acquired, LinkedIn got acquired by a company called Lynda.com, an e-learning company. I've been very, very interested in learning. And if we are to completely cure or very, very much slow down the aging process, and we are living hundreds you know, of years, as you and I, I think both believe is possible, 
then we are going to really have to improve people's ability to unlearn old skills and relearn new things because people get stuck in their ways. So in my opinion, you are like a super learner. You know, you're able to, as we've kind of talked about in this conversation, you're very intelligent and well-read and you at least know a little bit about a lot of different concepts that we've touched upon, you know, in this conversation from transhumanism to, uh, you know, everything here, simulation theory. How do you like to learn nowadays and how has that changed over your time period? And, and, and the final part of this is what advice can you give to people to think more critically and, and be better autodidacts, better self-taught learners? All I can say is it takes an interest in the world. I'll say one other thing. Something about languages always hit me and I think it, it bears on this generally. People have a tendency to think that that a language, for example, is all one structure. Um, let me start by saying, neither one of us speaks English. We speak a fair amount of it. But uh, you know, if you pay attention to English words, you'll realize that you don't have to go very far before you run into a word you've never seen before or heard before. That is, you and I do not know the entire English language. We know a lot of it, pretty much, but not all of it. And there's a tendency uh, when people try to learn a foreign language, and again, this probably bears on learning anything, the first mistake they make is they think that, for example, Spanish, they have to learn it all. No, you don't. You learn a word, un dia, and you learn another word, un mesa. You know, you learn word by word. And after a while, after a while, you gain vocabulary and ability, and you can speak a fair amount of Spanish, and then a fair amount more, and maybe someday you become fluent the way you are, say, in English. But a language is not one big monolithic structure. It's something you eat mouthful by mouthful. The second problem, and again, pretty universal in learning things, people are afraid to look like idiots. Most people, for example, learning a foreign language are afraid to say anything because they know they're gonna sound like a moron. Yes, you will, get over it. You know, the, I do the same thing with English. I learn some word and I get it wrong. All right, get over it. Stop being embarrassed and move on. Get it right the second time if you can. But I think that's true of anything. You know, if I decide I'm going to pick up um, quantum mechanics, oh my God, I'll never, okay, but you're not going to ever. What you're going to learn is learn something today. You read an introductory Wikipedia article and you scratch your head and go, I don't know what that meant. And you find out. But also, again, you're not afraid to admit that you really have no idea what they're talking about. Yes, you sound like an idiot. Did they sound like they've completely snowed you. Get over it. Move on to a simpler article. And day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, the next thing you know, you turn around and, my God, you understand it all. Or you speak fluent Spanish or Polish. You know, you, you learn things. You know, I used to say in Japanese, I speak some Japanese, but not very well yet. Yeah, <laughs> get over it, right? I think that's true in most things. One, you don't have to learn it all, learn as much as you can and be interested in it. And two, do not be afraid of being an idiot. Yeah, welcome to the club. We all are. I love it. And I don't think you use this word, but kind of what I heard is stay curious. Is that an important part of this? I think so. Um, I would, I'm amazed how many people have had interesting experiences in life. Um, I gave you some of the ones that I've had. There are a lot of other interesting ones too, but, but some people don't. And maybe part of that is luck, but part of that is being open to new experiences. You know, I, uh, I remember ending up uh, trying hang gliding. I ended up doing somersaults in my hang glider because I lost control. Actually, people thought I was doing a stunt. I just lost control. But how many people in the audience have tried hang gliding? Well, a lot of people haven't. I've never gone parachuting. You know, I used to teach scuba diving. But there are a lot of things I haven't done, some other things I have done. But it's that openness to new experiences, the going as you, you and your wife did around the world. That, that sort of thing that the result is you've had an interesting life. And for most of us, What's interesting about us is not the degrees, it's not the fact that you're chairman of that or president of something else or got elected as senator. What's interesting are the things that have happened to you. That's what makes you human. Those are the kind of things when you meet people, you know, it, if I walked into a room and I bragged about all the things I had done and you became senator and president, okay, that's fine. But that tends to turn people off. They think, God, either the guy's bragging or how come I didn't do that? Neither of which is very useful. But if I walk into the room and say, you'll never believe what happened to me last week, by the way, people want to know what it was. Um, they're just interesting stories. Here's a typical little example. I met somebody 
who had had the same car for 50 years. Well, that's nothing to brag about. On the other hand, it makes you go, how the heck did you do that? Did you keep it in the garage? No, he drove it around. Well, how did you keep, you know, see what I mean? Right away, you're asking questions. How did that happen? It's not a big thing. It's a little thing. But I think what I found most interesting about people are the things that they've experienced, the things they've been through, the odd things, sometimes scary things, sometimes frightening things, sometimes very funny things, sometimes moving things. But those are the things that make us human. And those are the things that you need to be open to in life. And sometimes that involves learning quantum mechanics or another language. Sometimes it involves learning how to make granola. Very interesting that you mentioned that because my wife just started making granola uh, a few months ago. I'll have to send her my, my favorite recipe. Somebody published it. <clears throat> Please do because the granola that she makes is better than any granola, granola that we buy at the store. And it's way, way cheaper with you know, just bringing your own ingredients. Mm -hmm. Very fascinating. I think it's, it's great advice. Um, healthcare versus trauma care. I feel like we talk about healthcare nowadays in the United States of America and first world countries, and we use this term healthcare, but it's really more trauma care. I think healthcare is up to the individual to keep up with their own health, right? I think I was talking. I didn't hear what you said. I apologize. No, not a bit. I was interrupting you. Um, no, you know, back to the point I raised, most people get good advice as to healthcare, even they get it from the grandmother and they don't always do it. Gotcha. Okay. So we'll end it on this. Um, first of all, I want to tell people you can connect with Dr. Michael Fossil if he so feels inclined on LinkedIn. Um, and www.michaelfossil.com is his website. There'll be links here in the description below. Also, Telesite. Are there any other ways, you know, you have email, are there any other ways that people can, if they want to be investors or learn more about Telesite or you, they can get in touch with you? Sure, I'd start with the Telesite website. You know, there's an easy way to, to go through that or LinkedIn. Um, and if somebody's interested, let me know. It's, uh, it's easy to learn more about what we're up to at Telesite. And if they don't find what they're looking for, I'll send it to them. Or they can take a look at that article coming out in a couple of weeks in Alzheimer's New Venture. Okay, great. All right, so we'll end it with this. This is a question that the PayPal mafia type folks, so this is Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, those type of folks, Reed Hoffman, uh, founder of LinkedIn that I worked at. They like to ask people this in interviews. Um, and it's a contrarian question. And the question is, tell me something that's true that most people disagree with you on. What causes aging? Most people think, without even thinking, most people think that it's entropy. That's not. It's a balance between entropy and maintenance. And again, most people would disagree, but most people don't even think about it in the first place. They just assume that things break down. No, it's... You know, when you think about it, Mike West used to make this point too, and, and I couldn't have agreed more. And something I always say too, if you think about it, every cell in your body is several decades old, that's fine. But it came from a cell from your mother, who got it from her mother, who got it from her mother. And that cell line is something in the order of 4.5 billion years old. Every mitochondria in your body came from your mother, who got it from her mother, who got it from her mother. And that same cell line of mitochondria is 1.5 billion years old. And in all that time, those cells and those mitochondria did not age. So you can't very well say it's entropy without pointing out that in fact, in many cases, particularly the cells you have in the mitochondria you have, there was no entropy until you got it. So if you wanna talk about aging, you can't simply say it's entropy without saying it doesn't happen sometimes and it's because of what? Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think that people should think about species as all being somewhat immortal. That might be stretching the word out too far and for some people's definition, but the point is that we're all here. We're in reality. We're alive now. Certain Our somatic cells age and, and we die, but if my wife has this baby and he lives and he you know, has another baby, then those genes that are kind of a part of me are gonna keep going to a certain extent. So all you're talking about is just being intellectually honest and curious and trying to figure out what it is exactly that is going to
take what we have in those germ cells and maybe put some of that or all of that in our somatic cells. And the telomerase, you know, uh, theory and the, the telomerase gene therapy seems to make the most sense to me by far. And, and I really, really appreciate you and all working out. We know it works in human cells. We know it works in human tissues. And we know it works in other organisms when we try it. In mice, for example, it can resell. So you can't very well say we can't reverse aging. Sure we can. We've already done it. The question is, how effectively can we do it? How safely can we do it? And can we do it in people? And this is one thing that I want to bring up. This is a side note, but I find this fascinating. I think you'll like this if you haven't heard this before. This was in, I think, 2012. I'm going off memory because I remember where I was living at the time. It was a team at MIT. They were using higher mathematics to study um, human, or not human, but cells on Earth to try and figure out exactly when, you know, cells came about and how they came about. And what the math showed them is that if you look at, you know, the smartest physicists on the planet, they say that our universe is about 13.8 billion years old based off the Big Bang. And they say that our planet was formed about 4.5 billion years ago. And then maybe they estimate single cells arrived maybe about a billion years later or so. But when they looked at the math, it actually showed that the cells were much, much older. But they didn't believe, some scientists didn't believe that cells could survive in the vacuum of space. But now, in the last few years, they've shown that cells, life can survive in the vacuum of space. So what I think, if you add up all these things, it's very possible that there could be many, many other cells that were alive billions of years ago in other parts of the planet. We just kind of had this planet seeded. So I don't know. It sounds crazy. I watch ancient aliens. I'm interested in all this stuff, but uh, it seems more scientifically possible and reasonable than what most people realize. I don't know. Is that I know that, that most of the things that we tend to believe scientifically these days, you go back 100, 200, 400, 500, 1,000 years ago, and people quote, knew couldn't be true. Things change. Probably a lot of assumptions that you and I make right now will turn out to be false. It reminds me of a lot of, um, actually, modern politics. You know, there are a lot of people who will look back 200 years ago and be appalled at some of the behavior uh, or the beliefs or the actions of people 200 years ago. Um, and they may be right, except they don't have the humility to realize that 200 years from now, people will look back at them and say the exact same thing. They have a tendency to think that they finally attained sainthood, and they're absolutely right. And I don't mean to knock their, their improvements in, in, or their desires about improving society and culture. Uh, but I wish people would recognize that we really have not attained sainthood yet. We're not perfect, no matter what you think you've got that's right. And that's true scientifically. No matter how far we've looked back, we kind of have assumptions that people were superstitious idiots in the Middle Ages. No, they were very bright, but they had different assumptions about some things. We probably are doing the exact same thing now. And you do mention this in your the Telomerase Miracle book, what you just stated there, and you go into a little bit more detail in it. So I'll plug your book once again. Folks should really look into that and think about the things that Michael's talking about, because I think they're very important for us to think differently, think critically, and, and solve these very important problems that, that you're trying to solve, the problem of, of aging and age-related diseases. So Michael, thank you so much. I want to give you an opportunity. Any final thoughts um, before we part ways here? Yeah, it reminds me of something you just said. As someone that we have talked about on this interview so far once said that I know more about aging and telomeres and, and clinical medicine and how those interact than anyone on the planet. However, even if that were true, I would estimate that I still know less than 1% of what there is to know about those topics. Way less. I love it. I think that's a beautiful way to end it because it shows that we, we all have to work together and uh, no one person can figure this out. That's another common theme that I've heard you mention in interviews and in, uh, in your book, you know. Um, so I think compassion, working together and focusing on the data are common themes that I've heard from you. And, and I don't want to get in the last word. That, that needs to be you. So what do you, what do you think about those, those thoughts there? Be considerate. Very beautiful. Um, anything else, Michael? No, except to say thank you. Appreciate it, Brent.
Thank you very much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. And I hope in some way that this uh, video and the work that I'm doing will in any way trickle down to help you and your team in any way. So thank you so much. Well, not to help us, but uh, not must stay yourself, but to go on and help a lot of other people who need it. Right. That's what it's really about. You, this, this work is for humanity, and, um, and I hope that people can understand this and appreciate this. But the Latin phrase is non sibi. Non sibi sed alia. Not for yourself, but for others. Non sibi. So again, not for yourself. You know, remember John F. Kennedy said, that's not what you can do, what the country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. It's a generic thing throughout life. What can you do for the people around you? It will bounce back on you. And you know, what goes around comes around. I can say that in Latin too, but still the same point. You know, what you, what's most important in life is not for yourself, it's for other people. Very beautiful. Michael, thank you so much for your time. I look forward to meeting you in person um, in late January at the um, Longevity Therapeutics Conference and uh, hopefully giving a great interview in person as well, too. I look forward to it. Thanks. Have a great day. Thanks, Brent, and good luck on the new baby. Oh, boy. <laughs> Thanks so much. Inshallah. Yeah, God willing. Okay. God willing. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.